tchau. Ah, tchau. Okay, I think, can you hear? No, okay. Okay, welcome everybody, um, our audience in person here in Belgrade and the public uh, from home online. So uh, this is the uh, presentation of a study called uh, um, the mobility, sorry, <laughs> um, the mobility of human capital within and from the Western Balkans uh, when innovation stops brain drain. So um, this is Anna Ferro from CESPI. I'm just introducing the um, rules of the house for the meeting today. So we're going to have a, a first uh, opening remarks session and then the presentation of the results and then the uh, discussion with the panelists, uh, invited speakers, and then the open discussion also with the public. When you want to put questions from online, please uh, use the uh, Q&A um, chat box, uh, and you cannot use the uh, video camera. And the recording will start, uh, and it will be available on the CESPI and OBCT website. So let me introduce you the director of the Institute of Italian Culture that is hosting this event, Roberto Cincotta. So he's uh, giving us our welcoming for today. Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Welcome to the Italian Culture Institute of Belgrade. I'm very honored to host this important ev event. Uh, this, uh, the discussion roundtable innovation in the Western Balkans as a key factor to reduce brain drain and to boost local regional development. Um, I thank uh, all the partner, cultural partner, uh, with whom we are organizing this uh, roundtable, uh, especially CESPI, Centro Studi di Politica Internazionale, uh, the Osservatorio Balcani Caucaso Trans Europa, e il Centro per la Cooperazione Internazionale. <clears throat> uh, a special uh, uh, welcome to uh, Martin Kratzke, uh, Head of Operation it, of the European Union to Serbia, and uh, <clears throat> sometime we will have the presence of uh, His Excellency the Ambassador Luca Gori, a, uh, of Andrea Cascone, head of the unit for the Adriatic and the Balkans of uh, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Uh, special thanks to Anna Ferro, researcher at CESPI, to Francesco Martino, to Serena Epis, and I welcome also uh, the discussants, so uh, Teresa Albano, Dej Antonic, Sinisha Marcic, Arian Imeri, Cristina Jankovic, Darko Subotin, Biagio Carrano, and Nena De Giudevic. So, uh, thanks again to be here and uh, uh, good morning to the remote uh, uh, public. And I give the floor now uh, to uh, Ms. Mr. Uh, Martin Klautke. Thank you. Please, Martin, have a seat. I'm standing next to you. So to help the other panelists come and join the discussion. And feel free to introduce yourself and your institution. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Martin Klauke, and I'm the head of operations sec section at the EU delegation in uh, Serbia and uh, dealing among other topics also with uh, education and uh, innovation. Now, it's my pleasure to uh, be here today to present you a little bit the perspective uh, from the EU side on that topic that you chose on the link between uh, brain drain and uh, innovation. And it's indeed also a topic that uh, is very close uh, 
to um, our interests on the on the EU side and our support activities, uh, we can definitely um, notice a brain drain in uh, Serbia, which uh, affects its development. Uh, we uh, see that, uh, according to current figures, uh, around 15% uh, of the population of Serbia is living or working outside of Serbia, which is quite an important uh, amount. Uh, we're speaking about uh, quite a number of people. And that obviously affects the country. It affects its development uh, potentials, affects uh, its uh, future um, development. Uh, and uh, we see, as it is always the case, a number of factors leading to that. There are a number of um, pull factors and a number of push factors. And uh, I think uh, one also has to take into consideration when we're speaking about brain drain that uh, also other countries, including the EU, is not uh, uh, is, is, is is also has a role uh, to play in that. Uh, um, if you look at the recently adopted communication on the European Year of skills, uh, for example, it makes explicit reference also to the need to attract uh, um, third party, third country nationals uh, to the European labor market, because in many European Union member states countries, we are facing a, a labor shortage, and, and as, especially in some areas of more qualified work. Uh, and so we are contributing, obviously, on that by trying to attract also the especially the qualified uh, persons uh, from third countries. Uh, but we also see a number of push factors. And uh, one of them, obviously, is the perspectives of the young people to find a good job, uh, to find the good working conditions here, to find perspectives, uh, um, not only on the, on the economic side, but other factors are also contributing to that, social conditions, but also generally the, 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 the functioning of the country, the, the democratic structures, participate possibly of political participation, exercise of human rights, uh, all these play a role also in, uh, in pushing a lot of uh, young people outside uh, of the country. And uh, the government has well uh, recognized this, uh, this issue here in Serbia, and uh, there's a a couple of years ago, they adopted a so-called economic migration strategy where they tried to address this issue by uh, um, mitigating the, the push factors, uh, but also by trying to make the best out of it. Uh, because indeed, um, brain drain or let's say um, emigration can also have a positive effect as long as there is a certain constant exchange and people coming back with new experiences, new skills, new knowledges, new languages. Uh, they are bringing remittances to the country. So there is not only negative effects, but there's also positive effects and government try to reflect this also in this, uh, in this uh, strategy. Now, when it comes to the, um, to the specific topic of what can uh, and should innovation uh, play uh, which kind of role it should play to prevent this brain drain uh, i think it has an important role to play because uh, innovation and uh, leads to a more um, competitive economy leads to the creation of new jobs and especially leads to the creation also of uh, more uh, qualified higher paid jobs that make people stay in the country um, because already let's say for lower paid jobs uh, it's mostly it's uh, it's it's not that problematic anymore in Serbia to find a job because uh, you have a lot of foreign direct investments uh, labor intensive production capacities uh, uh, where it's relatively easy for people for young people to find a job but when it comes to the more qualified jobs where people have more interesting jobs to do where they earn more this is still an issue and here comes in the factor of uh, of innovation of creating interesting jobs um, for these people and Serbia has done uh, a lot a lot on that uh, we have seen uh, in terms of the of the policy framework that has been uh, adopted in the in the last years we have seen a, a number of, of of strategic orientations to promote innovation um, you are probably aware of the so-called smart specialization strategy which is something I mean, which uh, every country in the 
in the in the EU member states does, but we also uh, promote this concept in our partners in the in the uh, in the enlargement countries. So Serbia has a couple of years ago adopted the smart specialization strategy where they identify a number of industrial um, sectors um, also that uh, they want to push for, identify a number of measures, incentives, uh, um, trainings, etc. There's an action plan also which has been adopted, which now comes to an end actually by the end of this year. And the government is currently in the process of working on a on a new action plan for the implementation of this smart specialization strategy. The strategic framework also comprises um, the startup strategy, especially for, um, for yeah, in young, innovative, small companies, a lot of them in the IT business also. Uh, there's a dedicated uh, startup strategy where um, one of the um, groups in Serbia, Digital Serbia Initiative, which is some sort of a um, private sector driven initiative actually has played a key role in identifying a number of uh, important measures in order to promote the startup ecosystem uh, in the country again ranging from issues of incentives uh, funding education uh, creating networks uh, and the government has adopted uh, this strategy last year and is now in the process of uh, implementing it so, Another important element uh, in the strategic framework is the industrial um, uh, development strategy, which also raises issues of uh, uh, fourth generation industrial development, uh, modernization, uh, greening and digitalization of uh, economic development, of, 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 uh, of private sector development. Uh, and um, and maybe let me mention a last strategy, which is the also linked to the to the to the innovation and uh, re reflecting also one of the aspirations of Serbia is linked to the artificial intelligence strategy. So Serbia is also one of the countries which in the region probably is one of the most advanced on that topic. Uh, um, and the aspirations are reflected in this artificial intelligence strategy. Um, the government has recently established a new artificial intelligence uh, institute also in the country successfully um, also bringing back a lot of um, a lot of um, experts and scientists from abroad and uh, basically re reversing also a little bit this brain drain uh, by attracting um, Serbian diaspora to come back to the to the country um, yeah, apart from the strategic frameworks, there's a number of other important initiatives that the government has undertaken. Uh, one of the areas also where there's a specific interest of uh, um, further developing this as an economic sector, um, further using the potentials it has for innovation and for creating the jobs of the future is the area of biotechnology. Uh, so there is a plan to set up a very ambitious um, um, biotechnology campus, so called bio four campus, uh, where they want to um, bring together a number of different faculties and research institutes together also with the uh, private sector in order to create a stimulating environment uh, to promote um, innovation in that sector. We um, have also witnessed a couple of years ago the establishment of the science fund, which provides uh, grants to um, scientists, to research uh, and development uh, institutions on the basis of uh, competitive process where they apply to. We have seen the establishment already of, of, of more than 10 years ago of the Innovation Fund, uh, which is an institute which provides uh, grants to uh, startups, small companies uh, to um, uh, develop their products and, uh, and go public. Uh, it's, an inst it's, it's an institution which has been supported already for more than 10 years by the European Union. We have invested around almost 50 million euros in the in the in the regular program of start of 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 matching grants of of small grants uh, and we have recently also um uh, helped them in the establishment of a new program which is called the uh, catapult program which is an accelerator program which tries to bring the um companies to the next level 
and helping them attract also um, funding from uh, venture capital funds and other uh, possible investors um, in order to build up and further expand their their business so this is also a rather successful program so far we we're just in the process of starting the second round of this so-called catapult program the first round of uh, i think it was 16 participants uh, has finished a few months ago and most of the companies have already succeeded in attracting additional funding to their businesses uh, and this program will also continue for the next few years uh, we have, um, I mentioned the science funds, it's also something that the U European Union actively supports. Uh, we have provided a grant of more than 30 million euros to the science fund uh, to provide grants uh, to scientists. Um, and we also have supported another initiative of the Serbian government, which is the creation of science and technology parks. Uh, they have done that by now in uh, four different cities where they also try to create a conducive environment for, for young people um, to create their own businesses, uh, to create an ecosystem, um, training is provided, some funding opportunities are, for, are, are foreseen for that. And we have also as EU um, contributed to that um, exercise. So. So these are some some important um, initiatives um, that uh, that the Serbian government has undertaken over the last few years. I mentioned already the EU support uh, to that. Uh, obviously, when it comes to brain drain um, and uh, promoting creation and maintenance of, of of jobs here, there are other areas where the EU is also. Uh, quite active in the area of employment and and uh, education. Let me maybe highlight one um, key initiatives also, um, which is also part of the <coughs> policies that the EU tries to promote in EU member states, uh, and which we are also now trying to promote in the Western Balkan countries, among them, among, among others in Serbia, which is the youth guarantee, which is basically the um, a commitment from the government. Uh, um, to provide to young people uh, within 19 days uh, either a job, uh, training, uh, or continued education. So this is something uh, which the government is now working on. There's an action plan which is in the process of finalization, and on our side, we will um, support that. Um, Overall, I would say the government has so far been been rather successful in its in its activities to create an innovative uh, science driven um, uh, economy. If you look at recent assessment, uh, such as the EU innovation scoreboard, uh, we see a, a consistent increase of the position of Serbia, the same also with regards to the global innovation index. Uh, there are also some dedicated rankings of the um, startup ecosystems where generally Serbia fares rather well. So the uh, overall, I would say the, the, res the, the success of the different initiatives is, is evident, uh, but also there remain a number of, um, of remaining challenges that the government needs to address. The, um, one of them being the fact that still despite quite some investments in the recent time, still a number of, of uh, innovation related institutions such as faculties, research and development institutes, they are still often in outdated, having old uh, infrastructure, old equipment, uh, maybe not um, uh, modernized uh, um, structures, procedures, etc. Especially when it comes to the translation of the research fundings uh, into um, concrete projects, into concrete cooperation with the private sector. So this technology transfer element is still some something that needs to be further developed. Um, and another important challenge is the overall funding that the government provides, despite the fact that there are a number of initiatives, new, new institutes, etc. A fact is still that the current uh, funding for, um, for science uh, and innovation is below 1% of the GDP, which is uh, uh, comparing with the EU average of 2.3% and the 
goal of 3% within the EU member states is still relatively low. And here the government has to make um, some further efforts also to further modernize uh, the um, remuneration systems in the uh, university and research institute, which is still uh, um, not not modernized and the basic uh, salary of uh, of people of scientists working in this in these institutes is not uh, really competitive in order to attract them and i think i will i will stop here and i'm happy to reply to possible questions thank you Thank you very much, Martin. And um, I would also remind the audience that Martin uh, will leave in probably less than an hour, right? Uh, 11.30, 10.30, okay, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so if you have an urgent question, <laughs> please take the advantage probably to put it now or to raise it now. And probably we can discuss it afterwards because I think some of the things that Martin mentioned were very interesting and overlapping with the, the findings of our study. For instance, uh, uh, how innovation institutions probably are not uh, already equipped for the role that they are asked to be taking in uh, supporting innovation, or also the interesting brain drain on the positive side, that is uh, return migrants or diaspora investments or knowledge transfer that could be um, a positive and potential aspect also inside innovation and also some of the challenges and um, obstacles in terms of uh, uh, fundings that are always uh, a, a problem and the technology transfer uh, and I think we are also very much curious to know more of the action plan that you mentioned more so maybe you can also probably share with us some documents afterwards that we can also share with the audience in case it's there is interest or if you have again an urgent issue that you want to raise maybe we can then uh, take it up at the end so um uh you have to use the microphone sorry i mean okay we have a very quick question very, very from francesco quick. martino from pbct the, the question will definitely be Francesco Martino from Osservatorio. Uh, uh, brain drain is uh, seen as a threat to Western Balkans, but at the same time, you mentioned that the uh, European Union is also part of the problem because we need people highly skilled, and so we are trying to attract them. So uh, how do we come out of this contradiction? We are trying to make people stay, but we need them home for, for our needs. Is there a contradiction, visible contradiction inside, or at least there is an open discussion in the Europe, European uh, institutions about this visible contradiction? Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I think there is no evident so solution uh, to that. Everyone is is is, is facing this uh, this issue, and uh, and honestly speaking, even Serbia is facing it. Uh, uh, they also there is actually there is a skills shortage, and it's uh, an issue which is increasingly recognized also by the um, by the government of Serbia as one of the main impediments to further economic growth, uh, and that actually concerns both unskilled and skilled labor. And uh, the government has uh, recently um, set up a working group actually to work on the on the on the labor laws uh, in order to allow also for um, immigration of unskilled labor from third countries, a facilitated immigration, which is already a reality. Uh, if you go to many construction sites, uh, you actually you don't see Serbian uh, uh, labor force there, but you see often uh, labor force from some Asian countries. Uh, so I think it's probably a cascade uh, system that we that we that we see that people you cannot avoid that people move where they find better working conditions. And it has always been the case. Uh, you will see probably Serbians uh, moving up uh, to countries where they can make uh, better income, where they have better possibilities. And you will have to, the issue that uh, even lower developed countries with lower salaries, people from there will come to Serbia in order to, to work here. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's not something which can, which can easily be, be resolved in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you very much, Martin. So um, I think we move forward. 
and we move to the next step. So I uh, really thank for your presence. And um, I call Serena Epis and Francesco Martino to come here on stage. And um, let me, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we switch. Thanks for this, sorry. Um, so we're gonna start um, uh, with the presentation of the results of the study. So the main reason we are here today. And today, in fact, uh, is a round table. So we want to uh, present you the finding of the study, but also involve the audience and the speakers and the panelists uh, in an um, open discussion and the critical discussion, because it's a sort of, uh, um, it's not the end of a study and of this investigation, but is a starting point for uh, further uh, elements. Okay, so um, just to remind you that Today, we, um, we have a um, panel of uh, uh, very um, knowledgeable uh, panelists uh, and uh, professionals in different fields. So stakeholders that represent different aspects that interlinked with uh, innovation and uh, brain drain. So we, we um, address some questions to this uh, audience and uh, we will try to um, address to this question, not really probably get into a final solution or response that are, what are the enabling factors that can be reinforced to support innovation in the Western Balkans and how differently the stakeholders involved can contribute to reduce brain drain and support the innovative development in the Western Balkan countries. So this is a very challenging and uh, um, high level objective, of course. And uh, um, we are here presenting today the results of a small research project uh, that was granted by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation that took place uh, during the, the last year. And it was uh, um, it involved uh, researchers from two think tanks based in Italy, which are OBCT and uh, CESPI. And we started with this uh, hypothesis that we wanted also to test uh, whether um, the um, um, reinforced conditions of entrepreneurial and innovative development in the Western Balkans can positively contribute uh, to increase employment conditions and opportunities and retain talents, so stop brain drain. So uh, is it true that working on and supporting increasing innovation can have an impact in uh, stopping brain drain. And we also had the scope, a uh, general goal, to um, bring up a different uh, narrative uh, of uh, uh, migration issues and development issues in the Western Balkan, pointing and focusing on innovation, which is a very modern and then uh, um, current uh, aspect in economic development. So uh, bringing up the um, uh, the touch on uh, um, innovation and youth talents in these uh, uh, countries. Uh, the methodology involved for this study includes a literature review on this uh, very wide aspect that uh, is innovation from different points of view and getting some methodological and operational definitions and the key concept that we, we could use during this study, collecting some data, and then with a fieldwork study uh, involving four, 14 case studies, and uh, my colleagues from OBCT will uh, um, provide you a, an overview of these uh, uh, 14 case studies. Of course, this is not uh, a huge um, uh, like a cross-country study. And uh, so it's, it has limited resources and capacities, but we had also challenges in uh, engaging the for-profit uh, sector in this research because it's very busy, of course, and is not used to participate in this kind of uh, investigations. And we cannot make our findings uh, too general, of course, because these are based on 14 uh, case studies. So, which is, of course, a limited uh, sample. And also talking of innovation and brain drain cannot be generalized again because there are specificities based on each 
case study, national uh, case context and economies and existing cluster or non-existing clusters. So again, what we are bringing up are the results of this uh, uh, approach and this study given these uh, limitations. Uh, just for the general context and to provide you the elements on the background of this study, of course, youth employment in the Western Balkans is a problem in terms of, of numbers. We have evidence on this. And then uh, on the other side, of course, youth unemployment is a problem. And as Martin was mentioning, there is a skill shortage, shortage in both uh, skilled and unskilled uh, labor force. So innovation and brain drain is obviously linked to labor market and skill shortages. And there are differences, as we mentioned, in the countries, so we cannot make it general statement in the Western Balkans, but brain drain is a massive in certain countries as Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Kosovo and Albania. Even in Serbia, there is a brain drain problem, but of course uh, is uh, differently related to the local economic context. Um, there is a general sort of mantra and discussion on brain gain so the contribution from migrants from abroad in terms of having an impact back home in terms of diaspora engagement, investments or knowledge transfer and it is a very um, positive and optimistic um, narrative but still uh, let's say there is a lack of evidence in the impact that this kind of uh, um, investments or uh, knowledge transfer can be um, can turn into visibility, but still is part of the discussion. So uh, as an operative concept uh, within the whole definitions uh, of uh, what is innovation, because we are not uh, all practitioners in innovation or we come from different fields, some from economic background, so sociology or political sciences, we adopted this uh, uh, definition that comes from the Community Innovation Survey in the EU, that innovation is any idea, good product, uh, process, service, that has not been used before. So it creates a difference between the before and the after. And innovation exists when you have an invention, a new idea that is commercialized. So that enters into the market that is used by a company or an enterprise. So if you only have a good idea, but you don't make it commercial, so you won't have an impact and you don't have uh, any economic impact in the development. And technology is not uh, namely and solely the, um, the protagonist of innovation, but is our in our uh, study, we were focusing mostly on digital and technical component in the innovation. So we were looking case studies that were highly uh, digital and uh, uh, technological innovative. And then the whole literature that uh, produced a lot of uh, knowledge on innovation and the economic development focused over the years on the innovation system, on the economic uh, um, entrepreneurial ecosystem, regional innovation systems, focusing on different uh, players and stakeholders. And for our research, we use this concept that is the innovative ecosystem that uh, relates uh, better than others to our scope that includes uh, economic agents, economic relationships, uh, and non-economic parts that are including the regulatory framework, the culture of innovations, visions and strategies, human capital, let's say a whole extended uh, um, universe that is able to transform knowledge into innovation and then into commercialization, of course. So um, this is to say that we use the systemic approach to this uh, innovative ecosystem that is not focused on individual players, only firms, only uh, enterprises, only policymakers, but an interaction between these different parts in the system. And something that we found also useful as a conceptual framework to approach innovation ecosystems are, uh, is the presence of three factors that are considered determinant for innovation ecosystem. When there is presence of clusters or district with the territorial proximity or not, strong university industry collaboration and the dynamic culture of innovation and to innovation. So when you have these elements, you will probably find an innovative ecosystem. 
and uh, talking of innovation in the Western Balkan, of course, as a positive and negative sides, there are, for instance, uh, uh, potentials due to unexplored markets that they represent, or the fintech uh, um, sector can open up to lots of market opportunities or applying innovation to traditional um, economic sectors. But on the other side, there are negative counterparts uh, due to different uh, challenges. And there are plenty of studies, of course, that focus on the obstacles and barriers to innovation in the region and in the different countries. So um, just for mentioning some is the limited availability of talents and the idea, the diff difficulty to enter new markets and network, uh, uh, weak cultural background, difficulties to access into capitals and resources and the foundings. But the literature also tells us that uh, the lack of funds and the venture capital is of course crucial, but is not the only one element that can support uh, the development of uh, innovative uh, uh, ecosystems. So it is an important part, but it cannot go alone without all the other um, systemic uh, co cooperation of other elements. Uh, and so just to mention some of the uh, most recent studies from the Regional Cooperation Council focusing on innovation and the Western Balkans, different are the um, obstacles that are mentioned and they replicate some of the uh, barriers that we already mentioned. So exist, uh, outdated existing uh, research and uh, innovation uh, or infrastructures uh, facilities, uh, the limited support of the government within uh, um, innovation infrastructures or research and uh, uh, innovation ecosystems. And this is the cause, this is the effect. So the limited uh, government presence, although uh, the, um, uh, the Serbian case study was uh, portrayed by Martin as a very advanced compared to other countries, but still probably there is still room for improvement and low cooperation uh, between innovation infrastructure in the region. And then uh, another study that was uh, focusing on the digital innovation districts uh, also mentioned that uh, um, these districts that are these um, um, districts offering services, support, uh, technical assistance are not even fully understood, but all stakeholders and beneficiaries. So sometimes you offer something that is not really uh, well interacting with the environment uh, that you want to um, uh, implement it in. And normally it, it is uh, limited the possibility to scale up uh, enterprises, but also there are, there are um, incubators or uh, preparation services that are uh, more um, evident. And then there is a limited investment readiness in the companies. So um, to conclude, um, we think, and this was the hypothesis also in our research, that uh, talented youth and human capital formation is a key ingredient for innovation for bringing up new knowledge to companies, and it represents a raw asset in the Western Balkans. So there is, but is not really fully leveraged in the economic uh, um, framework. And our question so turned into like, what are the impact of policies and public or private initiatives in leveraging talented youth and innovation ecosystem when we are considering the three factors um, previously mentioned. So in the clusters, in the presence of the cluster, in the university collaboration, in the culture of innovation. So our policies and initiatives, including youth talent formation and the empowerment within these uh, three uh, dimensions. And uh, mm, I, I conclude also mm, putting a, a, a strategy uh, from the uh, World Bank that was uh, from 2013 on how to um, uh, announce the research and innovation for economic growth in the Western Balkan. So uh, finding that um, within the different dimensions, that is the research sector, the technology transfer enterprise, and then institutional policy framework, there is a weakness. And this weakness uh, should be turned into a positive outcome, uh, whether there is a reinforcement in the regional approach and the capacity reinforcement into research and innovation applied to local environments. So 
in innovative uh, ecosystems, promote collaboration with the business sector, and then improve the complementarity with the EU financing mechanism. And for us, it, it, the question was also including youth or human capital formation and empowerment within all these uh, dimensions. So um, I am sorry. Oops. Uh, I stop here. That was the introductory part, and I give the floor to my colleagues that will give you the, um, an overview of the uh, fieldwork research. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm from my side. Uh, we will now present the second part of our research project, which uh, um, has been dedicated to a non-field mapping of innovative realities in the region of the Western Balkans, and in particular of exemplary cases that can that have the potential to uh, find and to provide a positive solution to the phenomenon of the brain drain, and also have the potential to provide and offer um, a different and a new vision of the region has one a, a dynamic region focusing and emphasizing positive cases of, uh, of innovation. Uh, before introducing uh, very briefly the methodology that we use to carry out the mapping, I wanted to underline that um, our intent in doing this uh, uh, on-field mapping was not to provide, to conduct an economic research of the system of innovation in the region, but we rather intended our objective was rather to um, gather information from the field, from realities that work in the region to gain a better understanding of the social, of the social and cultural um, context that, that surrounds innovation and that characterize innovation ecosystems in the Western Balkans. And uh, um, so as when it comes to our mapping, we, conducting, uh, we conducted 14 in-depth qualitative interviews with key innovation actors, focusing in particular on three case studies that are Albania, Kosovo and, um, and Serbia. Uh, once again, as Anna already mentioned in the introduction, our sample is not that big. Nevertheless, the, we, nevertheless within this small sample, we try to uh, involve different stakeholders in order to have a comprehensive and a broad perspective into an insight into the ecosystem of innovation in, in these three uh, case studies. For this reason, we uh, involved in our research different stakeholders, and you can see them listed here. So the first kind of type of stakeholder there are startups, of course, also in the Western Balkan, when we talk about innovation, startups are key actors that can promote new, new ideas and also new uh, business opportunities. So uh, we, we interviewed different representatives of startups that are active in different fields. So we focused on the IT sector, so information technology, but not only. So we also interviewed the representative of startups that work in other economic sectors, such as creative industry or or the sustainability rating for businesses. So also in this case, to have a broad understanding of the ecosystem. Um, what we find out from uh, found out from our research is that it is uh, the startup ecosystem in the three case studies that we consider is quite uneven, is quite different. There are cases such as the Serbian one where the environment is uh, somehow more enabling, more favorable for the growth and the development of startups, while other cases, and here I'm referring to Kosovo and Albania, the, the context where startup works is still uh, um, is more fragile in a way also because it's a, it's a rather young sector, the, the one of startups in these two countries. So uh, we have a, um, a system that is still in construction. So to say there are shortcomings, there are some constraints that still limit the startups from uh, exploiting and expressing the, the innovating power to the fullest. So um, yeah, the, the startup ecosystem is quite is quite uneven between the, the case studies that we that we studied. Um, as you see, another stakeholder that we took into account is our business incubators, because of course, for the development of the startup ecosystem, business incubators play a prominent role. Um, one example that we, uh, that we described, that we analyzed in our research is uh, Officina, which is uh, an incubator from Albania. Unfortunately, the director should have been here today, he could not. Um, however, Officina is one of the key players, key actors in the innovation ecosystem in Albania, 
providing uh, services to different kinds, uh, to different types of startups working in different fields uh, with, of course, uh, an important technological component in their work. Um, among the services that Officina provides, there, are, there is, for example, um, technological assistance, but also uh, business modeling or go-to-market strategy. So a wide um, offer that is given to, to startups without any charge. So this is also an important, an important aspect, to aspect to take into consideration. Uh, other kind of stakeholders that were involved in our research are non-profit organizations on the one hand and professional organizations on the other. When an example of non-profit organization is, for example, the Innovation Center Kosovo, which works somehow similarly to uh, business incubators offering different services to startups and other innovation actors, such as uh, services such as technological assistance, but also training programs for the young for young people to help them um, enter the labor market and also public events to give visibility to this issue to the sector and to attract new talents and new attention. Um, on the other end, considering professional organization, we have the example of the Serbian Gaming Association that we will uh, talk a little bit more in deep later, which is a central pillar of the cluster of the gaming industry in, uh, in Serbia. And it also shows the potentiality and the importance of the emergence of a cluster in a specific industry, such as the gaming industry in Serbia, to wow. somehow provide positive, a positive response to the problem and the phenomenon of the brain drain. Uh, finally, other types of factors involves include international financial institutions, and here I'm referring to the uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and its uh, Star Venture programs, through which it uh, uh, promotes, it supports the innovation system in the region, uh, uh, providing uh, financial, financial help, financial instruments. And finally, last but not least, is uh, uh, academia. So we interviewed some representative of the academic world because of course, the economic, the education system plays a key role, plays a prominent role in promoting and in supporting innovation, entrepreneurial spirit, and in the education of qualified personnel as well. But once again, we will talk a little bit more in deep about the role of the, of the education system later on. So we uh, focused on these stakeholders and we investigated different aspects of their work, of course, starting from analyzing the innovative innovation potential that these realities have and also understand, trying to understand the condition and motivation behind their success. We also um, investigated their capacity to attract young qualified workers and also uh, we wanted to understand whether the brain drain affects their work and eventually how they try to implement, try to find and implement some strategies or measures to tackle this problem and to deal with this problem. problem. Problem, And finally, um, other two aspects that we investigated, we asked our um, stakeholders, the people that we interview, were they uh, perception about the uh, legal and also the political, so the normative and political frame framework, whether they consider it to be enabling and favoring their, their work or not. And finally, the role of the European Union and some European policies, such as the smart spe spe specialization strategy, and what is its impact, how they perceive it impact on the sector on innovation on, on innovation promotion in in the three case studies so that was just a quick introduction on on this second phase which was a more empirical uh, part of our research so to say and i will leave the floor of the word to my colleague who's going to talk a little bit more about uh, key points and relevant issues that emerge from our analysis thank you hello hello everybody and dobar dan Buongiorno. Uh, so thank you all for being here today. Uh, a lot of things have been already mentioned by my colleagues, and I really want uh, to leave as much time as possible to our guests to contribute to the discussion. So I will go directly and briefly to some of the findings that we managed to gather uh, with this research and that we think uh, could be helpful to, you know, move uh, the discussion about uh, innovation in the Western Balkans a step further. Uh, of course, I would start uh, with the complex relationship between uh, innovative sectors and brain drain, since this is the main topic of uh, our research. Uh, what we found was not that surprising that the innovative sectors uh, uh, truly have a potential 
to keep retain highly skilled uh, workers in the Western Balkans. But what is interesting, I think, uh, is that uh, this is particularly true when uh, innovative enterprises and businesses manage to gather in into what we can call innovative clusters. This seems to be, um, we can spend some word after uh, a bit later about this particular aspect. Of course, some of the aspects that, you know, allow innovative uh, enterprises to uh, to have this potential are pretty obvious. Uh, the first one is the capacity to provide better salaries. I think in Serbia you say koliko uh, para, toliko music or something like that, that is, you know, without the money, uh, there's no possibility to do that. Um, and uh, of course, uh, this uh, uh, gap in salaries between Serbia and, for example, more developed economies uh, plays a central role in, you know, pushing people to, to move. Um, at the same time, what we found is that the innovative uh, uh, enterprises and sectors uh, seem to be well aware that today uh, highly skilled workers are not looking only for money, even if this is an important part, of course, of the of the of the picture. And uh, being aware, they are uh, able to provide uh, something more than that. Uh, for example, when it comes to personal and professional uh, development uh, and fulfillment, uh, innovative uh, uh, enterprises, even in you know, uh, let's say, marginal on a global scale, uh, um, uh, places like the Western Balkans, are able to uh, provide the, the opportunity to uh, work on products that are placed on the global market. So this is something that uh, other sectors in the region really struggle to do. Uh, at the same time, uh, innovative uh, uh, enterprises by definition are uh, often very young. So they give the opportunity to, to skilled workers to start something from, from scratch. So to share with their teams, not only the challenge, but also the pride of contributing to create something which is going to make you know a change in their world and maybe in the outer world uh, as a whole um, very often uh, innovative enterprises have a strong request towards the institutions to contribute uh, in a robust way to build uh, a framework which can you know help uh, limiting the brain drain factor but at the same time they are not only passive they are not only asking for something but they are pretty proactive in uh, offering new ideas uh, to 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 uh, to face the problem uh, for example in in our research we found that uh, some of the the enterprises uh, we talked to were very much focused on uh, developing what is can be can be called an employed focused uh, uh, culture or, for example, offering shares of the company itself to the workers. So, you know, uh, engaging them also from this point of view. Uh, when we talk about uh, innovation and brain drain, what seems to be extremely interesting, and I would spend a couple of words about that, is how, according to their perception, the recent pandemic changed the uh, the um, market of the work market and their perspectives uh, what is interesting it seems that uh, the pandemics uh, uh, worked as a giant uh, accelerator which uh, you know pushed forward a lot of um, elements and uh, trends that were visible even before the the uh, pandemic started of course, the most vis visible of them all is that it, it broke even more this relationship between uh, uh, physical plays and working activity. So fostering, for example, home working. This proved to be, for many of the respondents of the people we uh, talked to, at the same time, a big uh, opportunity, uh, for example, because it helped uh, developing uh, a better working environment for uh, skilled uh, workers. But at the same time, as it always happens, there is no rules without thorns, also a challenge because it's exacerbated the, the uh, competition for these talents uh, on the global market. So today, when we speak about brain drain, we are not only speaking of people that decide to leave a particular country uh, to move and work in, in another place, but also a lot of people who stay in the same place, but start, you know, uh, using their talent for uh, uh, companies that are located somewhere else. And this, of course, uh, you know, pushes, uh, I would say, uh, exaggerates the competition for the talent uh, at the local level. Um, 
as I said, uh, very important uh, what we found about uh, gathering into clusters. Uh, somehow the best example we found is the gaming industry here in Serbia. And uh, the, the aspect we, we found most interesting is that uh, when gathering a cluster, uh, business uh, and enterprises uh, seem to see uh, much more advantages in cooperating, collaborating than risks in internal competition. Uh, maybe the particular case has some peculiar aspects because uh, the gaming industry, uh, for example, is not competing on the product level when you speak about uh, you know, the Serbian gaming industry, for example, because the playing field is global, is the world, so they are not competing on that level. But for example, they are competing on the talent level, but uh, nevertheless, it seems to be better for them, as far as we could understand for our research, to develop together talents at the risk of losing some of them to uh, uh, local competition, then losing them for good if they move uh, outside uh, of the of the of the system. Um, another uh, strong, uh, um, let's say, co co another consideration that uh, strongly emerges is the importance of uh, vital and uh, uh, ready to react uh, uh, education system. Uh, what we found uh, in the cases uh, we studied is that uh, uh, most of the, our respondents uh, have a perception that uh, uh, the education system is willing and to some extent ready to provide new opportunities. Uh, uh, of course, this is extremely important uh, at the higher levels of education and the most uh, when we speak about, uh, about uh, universities. And we found uh, uh, some interesting cases when these institutions are uh, able to renew their offer. One case, uh, uh, of course, is the Belgrade University of Arts. I hope that uh, uh, our guests will say something about that, that uh, recently started a new department on visual effects, uh, animation and video games. So uh, answering somehow the call of the, of the industry, if we can say so. Uh, at the same time, there are still challenges uh, one of the biggest is, you know, uh, sort of rigidity when it comes to uh, uh, to change. Uh, for example, one of the the problems we found is this difficulty in bringing uh, uh, new expertise into all the uh, curricula. For example, uh, if we we have people that have the expertise to be uh, teachers. Uh, in the for this you know new innovative uh, topics, but they don't have the the degrees or the titles because they just not exist still. So there is a mismatch between the needs and and what uh, the uh, university can do. Um, we found that this uh, uh, positive contribution uh, of the also private education, especially when private education plays along with public one, uh, that this private education uh, very often uh, seems to be faster to react uh, to the needs of, uh, of uh, innovative sectors. Uh, but at the same time, what we found, uh, uh, what we were told by our um, respondents is that without a strong public uh, education system, uh, a private one is almost impossible to build. So one is not, I would say, one is not excluding the, the other one, but they, they are strong when they work somehow in the same direction. The last point uh, I'd like to briefly point out, and it's uh, still, let's say, um, uh, an open question. So I would like to discuss it with you because I think it's pretty important. Uh, is the capacity of uh, uh, the education and economic system in the Balkans to promote not only specific innovative skills, but to promote a deep-rooted innovation culture. Here, the answers we received uh, were not consistent that much, were very nuanced. According to some, there is uh, the capacity you know, and, and the presence of this innovation uh, culture, even if very often not thanks to, but despite the system somehow, but according to others, uh, uh, the systems in, in the Western Balkans, both economic, uh, educational, even uh, political one, uh, are somehow actively trying to suppress, you know, critical thinking, which is the basis uh, to, to some, you know, innovation, innovation culture. So uh, again, uh, I'll leave this uh, question to, to part of the discussion. I will end it here. And uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, till now.
Thank you very much, Francesco Serena. And uh, we move to the next section that is uh, uh, first uh, discussion and round table with uh, some of the speakers that are invited today. So um, I tell our friends online, Sinisha Marcic, to get ready, you're gonna be the next one. And I ask also the Antonic to come and sit next to me. And then also we have uh, Teresa Albano that uh, is online and in fact she um, she will give us another contribution just for some changes in the agenda as was mentioned already uh, Arian Imeri the director of the business incubator of officina um, in Tirana was supposed to be here but he had some personal problems so he won't be here and even Nenad Djurjevic from the um, Chamber of Commerce in Belgrade had some personal issues in the night so uh, won't be here and we're going to have the ambassador Luca Gori and Andrea Cascone at the end because of institutional constraints so sorry for uh, these uh, communications <laughs> uh, so Sinisha please take your 15 minutes and then uh, we're gonna put also questions at the end uh, Anna, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for the invitation to uh, share some of the developments at the regional level. Uh, and my apologies for not being able to join you in Belgrade physically. I'm currently in Croatia attending uh, another conference that I committed to before. Uh, uh, kind greetings to Dejan. Uh, we were together uh, last week in Sarajevo. Hi, Dejan. Uh, and of course, to, to all, all other uh, panelists. Um, well, uh, Anna invited me to uh, to speak uh, about regional development when it comes to uh, innovation ecosystem. Uh, just briefly uh, to introduce the Regional Cooperation Council, we are a political organization, uh, mainly uh, dealing uh, in the Western Balkans, so six Western Balkan economies that haven't joined uh, the European Union, although we broadly cover Southeast Europe, basically from Slovenia to Turkey. Uh, Within the RCC, uh, I'm specifically in charge of uh, regional innovation area, um, essentially um, trying to develop or trying to assist development of regional innovation ecosystem. Uh, this is uh, easy to say, but quite difficult to implement, uh, given uh, many constraints that uh, some of the speakers uh, previously have mentioned. Uh, during the pretty elaborate uh, explanations, uh, first about Serbia, but also uh, regionally. Uh, I must say that Serbia is, is a front runner compared to uh, the rest of the region you know, in many respects. Uh, Serbia is currently at 0.9% uh, of GDP investment uh, in research and innovation, uh, as opposed to the rest of the region. Uh, on average, uh, the region invests um, between 3.5 and 4% uh, from GDP in research innovation, which is a uh, pretty uh, different picture compared to the EU average of 2.3. Uh, although some changes have uh, been sort of introduced over the last several years, uh, we are still largely behind many uh, European uh, member states, uh, including those that have joined uh, later uh, the European Union. Uh, according to European uh, Innovation Scoreboard, uh, you probably know that all uh, economies that have joined the scoreboard so far are modest innovators, uh, although we are seeing uh, some uh, improvements, in particular uh, improvements in Serbia, North Macedonia and Montenegro, uh, Albania and, and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina are kind, kind of catching up, but we are still uh, largely behind in many respects. And when it comes to regional innovation uh, ecosystem developments, we are pretty much at the very beginning. Uh, and this is one of the issues that uh, I'm personally struggling uh, with uh, when explaining internally to, to uh, my uh, senior management uh, what still has to be done. And many things need to be done uh, basically from scratch. Uh, let me just walk you through uh, sort of three uh, key components of uh, innovation e ecosystems. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, human capital, innovation infrastructures and, and access to finance, basically. Uh, when it comes to uh, overall uh, activities, uh, we've introduced uh, several documents that have not been uh, created until recently. Uh, for example, we assisted last year uh, four Western Balkan economies create their own uh, research, in, uh, research uh, infrastructure roadmaps. Uh, this is one of the requirements set by the European Commission. So now 
uh, Albania, Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, Kosovo, and North Macedonia have their own uh, research infrastructures. As a follow up, we also uh, produced uh, the first regional uh, research and innovation uh, infrastructures roadmap, which uh, portrays the current state of art uh, in the region. Uh, I believe that Mart Martin mentioned in the beginning that uh, the existing infrastructures are really uh, pretty outdated. Uh, they're relatively modest compared to uh, major European infrastructures, research infrastructures, and innovation infrastructures too. Uh, they are pretty much basic, uh, but uh, this is not the key issue. The key issue is the fact that most of these infrastructures that have uh, some potential that can be used tend to be uh, heavily underused and uh, in many cases uh, without, uh, in many cases actually secluded from various potential uh, stakeholders, including researchers, uh, businesses, uh, civil society organizations, uh, and international uh, organizations who, who seem to be interested in using some of these uh, resources in the region. Uh, this uh, roadmap also showed uh, that uh, we have some uh, competitive advantages as, as a region uh, compared to uh, some member states in European Union uh, overall. Uh, we've instructed our uh, external consultants to uh, conduct uh, a short uh, scientometric or bibliometric analysis of the most productive scientific disciplines in the region. Uh, and based on Web of Science and Scopus uh, papers published over the last 10 years, it turns out that uh, many uh, researchers in the region publish in the field of energy, uh, environmental protection, more broadly speaking, uh, which uh, basically taps into some of the key documents uh, adopted uh, by the region's leaders uh, over the last couple of years, including the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans. Uh, and we see many opportunities in this respect, in particular when it comes to green energy. Uh, many uh, papers have been published in processing industries, like, like metal industry, uh, wood, uh, machinery. Uh, tourism uh, is one of the uh, top uh, scientific interests, uh, obviously, in the region. And broadly speaking, agriculture, farming, uh, food production, with an emphasis, again, on organic uh, food production. Uh, this uh, happens to match with most of the region's uh, strategic documents and uh, some of the uh, smart specialization strategy uh, priorities set uh, right now by Montenegro and Serbia, who have adopted the estuaries, but also by uh, Albania, North Macedonia, that are uh, nearly uh, about to complete the, the estuaries and adopt them by the national parliaments. Uh, similar trends we also see in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo. Uh, in other ways, uh, in other words, uh, we believe that there is uh, uh, quite significant significant potential in the region that uh, is not tapped, and uh, many things need to be done to, to make uh, this happen. Uh, uh, as a regional cooperation council, we are not uh, a donor type of organization. Our main role is really to ensure that uh, and enable uh, regional communication, regional cooperation uh, to uh, streamline uh, coordinated efforts in the region in, in various fields, innovation, research, uh, industrial development, uh, investment uh, promotion, uh, financial markets, digital transformation, uh, various fields, including green uh, agenda as well. Uh, and uh, our, our key goal really, uh, apart from that, is to somehow bring on board various organizations that have resources to assist the implementation of the strategic goals set by uh, the region's governments. Uh, we see the EBRD here, which is one of the uh, key players in, in this uh, respect. But we also uh, try to encourage as much as possible cooperation with other European organizations, such as the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, uh, Eureka Network, Cost Association, uh, Enterprise Europe Network. I'm currently uh, in the conference here in Croatia. Uh, who have the capacity to implement uh, various projects and various initiatives that uh, could, when put together, uh, bring uh, kind of cumulative or compounded uh, effects in the region. Uh, 
by uh, through through our regular work, we also uh, try to support uh, research infrastructures and innovation infrastructures. Uh, our emphasis over the last uh, couple of years has been on tech transfer offices in the region. Uh, many of them are uh, in very early stages of development, but we believe uh, there's uh, ample room for improvement in this field. We also tried to support digital innovation hubs. Uh, last year, we mapped uh, all digital innovation hubs in the region, all self-declared ones. It turns out that, uh, and this resonates well with uh, the previous speaker's uh, conclusions, uh, many organizations believe that uh, they have the capacities to uh, act as digital innovation hubs. Unfortunately, very few of them uh, are uh, fully uh, uh, digital innovation hubs. Uh, many of them offer pretty basic services such as education courses, um, uh, some basic digital uh, tools, uh, etc. But much has to be done uh, to, to uh, get things uh, going. Uh, over the last couple of years, we also uh, support the national contact points in research innovation. Uh, although this may sound as, as very uh, modest, uh, we believe that by supporting the bridges that connect research communities on one hand and uh, existing opportunities on the other hand, we can do, do much more. And uh, your research on uh, innovation and human capital uh, certainly boils down uh, well, uh, having in mind that uh, by uh, 2020, I believe, uh, between 2010 and 2020, uh, nearly 1.6 million people have left the region. Uh, most of them, unfortunately, from my home country, Bosnia-Herzegovina, but also from, from other uh, economies uh, in, in the region. Uh, and we are seeing this trend uh, as something that is probably going to continue. Uh, we need to invest uh, very focused efforts in creating environments and creating uh, fertile environments for people to thrive in, in particular for creatives, is, I believe, the key uh, factor that determines whether people will stay or leave. Uh, we believe also that uh, our enormous uh, diaspora could assist uh, in this process by bringing knowledge back to their home communities. Uh, by uh, knowledge transfer, we also mean various types of uh, initiatives, including investments uh, into their home communities, networking, uh, mentoring programs, etc. Et because we uh, tend to be uh, pretty uh, kind of uh, isolated from many, many uh, ongoing trends in Europe and globally. And diaspora does have this enormous potential to uh, bring back to, to their communities uh, if it's approached in uh, polite way. Uh, in the previous years, we've seen many politically uh, motivated uh, initiatives that boil down usually to uh, extracting money from diaspora. Uh, we need to uh, assume a, a different approach. We need to treat those uh, people as uh, real gems uh, uh, who can benefit uh, our economic and, and social development. Um, just to, to mention, and perhaps I can close uh, with uh, these few remarks, uh, we also established uh, recently with the United Nations Development Programme uh, a regional network of women in STEM. Uh, women, uh, generally speaking, tend to be uh, the most underused uh, resource uh, in the region, if I can put it that way, so sorry uh, for perhaps a bit harsh uh, terminology, but uh, many women uh, tend to stay outside of the workforce. Uh, and given that uh, we have enormous brain drain, that we have enormous uh, skill shortages issue uh, throughout the region, uh, just to, to let you know that according to Balkan Barometer, a regular annual survey we conduct with the general public and uh, businesses, uh, two out of three uh, employers in the region believe that uh, governments should put in place uh, various new initiatives to encourage uh, upskilling, reskilling, in particular uh, to uh, incentivize uh, our diasporans to return to, to their home communities because they are struggling, obviously, and this trend is going to continue. Uh, we've been trying with this web, uh, network of women in STEM to encourage uh, young girls, uh, women to enter STEM careers. Uh, on average, we stand well when it comes to uh, gender balance. 
uh, actually we, we fare much better than most Western European uh, countries when it comes to participation of women in uh, STEM education. Unfortunately, many of these uh, clever and, and creative young women uh, migrate to teaching professions uh, once they graduate instead of uh, developing and building their careers in industry. Uh, so overall, uh, and uh, just one, one more point, uh, Martin mentioned at the beginning that uh, Serbia uh, already has very uh, successful uh, innovation fund uh, that's been in place for 11 or 12 years now. Uh, a science fund, uh, Serbia has been introduced three years ago. Uh, only North Macedonia has uh, also uh, um, a functional innovation fund. Uh, and uh, Montenegro just introduced its own uh, with some uh, initial programs being launched, uh, whereas the other three economies do not have uh, these uh, uh, instruments in place. This is very discouraging for uh, innovative uh, teams. Uh, they simply do not have a fertile environment to, to develop in. Uh, that's why uh, the World Economic Forum and the Regional Cooperation Council have been pushing uh, over the last two years or so uh, for the establishment of a regional innovation fund uh, that would focus primarily on early stage, so precede uh, innovative uh, teams, uh, to prepare them for what Dayan uh, and his team are basically doing. Uh, where teams uh, after some level of maturity can apply for uh, various types of funding and supports offered by uh, Star Venture, for example, and, and some other uh, similar programs, for example, EDIF, uh, INIF, uh, financed by the European Commission. Uh, so overall, uh, let me conclude with this. Uh, the, uh, the region uh, has developed in many respects. Uh, our uptake of uh, an absorption of uh, EU funds has been steadily growing over the last level, several last years uh, with Horizon 2020 and now Horizon Europe. However, we are still uh, behind in, in many, many respects. Uh, there's uh, enormous room for um, changes, for improvements in, in this uh, field. Uh, and I would say that the key uh, factor that really uh, determines whether people will uh, stay uh, in their home communities is whether they have an environment in which they can experiment and grow. This is particularly inform, uh, important for innovative teams who have uh, many ideas, but if these ideas fall on barren land, uh, many of them will simply perish. Uh, with this, I, I conclude and thank you very much for the invitation. I hope this hasn't uh, taken too long. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sinisha. Um, just the practical question because he's hidden he's in his hotel room in Albania because he is in another conference. How long can you stay with us? I'm in Croatia, actually, uh, but oh, sorry, I, will sorry, stay, Croatia. <laughs> I will stay until the end of the panel. Uh, okay, I have, so we uh, can put questions at the end of the panel uh, yes. in case there are questions yes. for you. Thank yes. you very much. Uh, and thank you very much uh, also to um, bringing up the issue that uh, there is a potential uh, to be exploited and not to be wasted in order to create uh, opportunities, whether to stay, or whether to go instead of having an only option to go. So I think this is a turning point. So um, in presence, so we have Dian Tonic, and please, uh, if you want to introduce yourself and then uh, your institution and then uh, react to all the different issues. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks again for having me here uh, today. Always a big pleasure to contribute to uh, any kind of discussion that would foster the development in uh, our uh, in our region. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, I come from a large financial institution, uh, European Bank for Reconstruction Development, and uh, I'm in charge for uh, this Star Venture Program uh, in the region of the Western Balkans. It is it used to be the the newest uh, uh, EBRD initiative in the region. I, we have started some some others, but uh, in the last three and a half years, uh, we tend to uh, directly support high potential startups from the region, also to collaborate with a range of different stakeholders, 
mainly incubators and uh, uh, regional accelerators. Uh, and the, the third pillar of the program would be the, um, very, very vaguely, the ecosystem development. Uh, as for the mechanisms that we have uh, developed for uh, uh, within the program and uh, aiming to to uh, offer them to the the wide set of uh, beneficiaries in the region, uh, I must say that any kind of financial and non-financial support, especially here in the region, makes no sense if it's not uh, made in collaboration with other programs, as Sinisha just mentioned, the, uh, the others that are dealing with the uh, early stage businesses, if we don't collaborate with them, then our interventions make no other sense. Same goes for us. If we don't collaborate with uh, 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 the uh, investment side of the story, if we don't collaborate with partner with VC funds, uh, uh, other uh, uh, investment mechanisms that are available in the region, that the whole um, the whole initiative uh, or, and, or even trying to uh, to make any change in the region won't make uh, much sense. Uh, so far, we have uh, supported 31 uh, high potential startups from all six countries of the region. Uh, we also supported directly 11 and indirectly over uh, 20 different accelerators, hubs, um, incubators, associations, etc. Uh, some of them are uh, mentioned previously in previous uh, um, uh, presentations. I'm very sorry that uh, uh, Arya is not here with us today, but also happy that here that uh, Serbian Human Organization is also invited to this discussion and looking forward to start a collaboration with them, uh, hopefully very, very soon. Uh, as for the ecosystem development, uh, maybe I can provide the answer to, to Francesco uh, uh, about his last uh, topic, why some things are not being developed in a way they should. Uh, Francesco, you said about Nema uh, Paranea uh, Musica, so uh, no, no, uh, no money in the music, but there is also another expression, radio ne radio svira mi radio. Even if I work or not, if I'm not working or not doing anything, the radio is still on. And that's the old expression from uh, the, the communist times. And I'm afraid it's still on. And for the, the innovation or starting something new, uh, something that makes a step ahead, it really takes uh, additional effort to be made. Uh, it comes, uh, it, it applies to education system. It applies to all of us dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, innovative uh, businesses. It comes to the politics as well. Uh, also the uh, businesses. And if all of us uh, try at least to make a little step over the agenda that we are tending to follow and over the, uh, the uh, everyday business we want to make, maybe we will uh, uh, contribute to, to the change. Um, Fortunately, the soil for innovation here is very good. Uh, people here survive with only uh, uh, a couple of hundreds of euros of their annual salaries, while the expenses are three times bigger. And it's, I, I can't answer uh, to that phenomenon by others uh, saying that they're, the people are still very innovative, even in their everyday, uh, their, their everyday lives. Um, uh, jokes aside, there is a uh, high potential coming uh, from all over the region, not just from the Serbia as probably the leading economy uh, in the Western Balkans, but all over the, the region. There is a big uh, potential coming from the legacy that uh, former Yugoslavia had in this uh, technical sciences. And uh, generally speaking, there were some research and development centers that are still uh, have a potential to contribute to the growth of the uh, businesses that are uh, aiming to scale globally. Uh, investing in, uh, especially in IT industry, in certain businesses is uh, still a uh, on a low scale, 
it takes uh, innovation, it takes uh, courage, and it takes uh, you know some guts to start our own business in this uh, silly uh, surrounding. But still, it, uh, we have to admit that there are a lot of great businesses, a lot of great initiatives of uh, especially young people uh, while in the, the Western markets, um, uh, success is still a prerogative of you know more experienced uh, entrepreneurs. But still here we can see a lot of young people uh, uh, succeeding in starting businesses that are growing out of not just local and regional markets, but growing locally. And we have to, to congratulate to each one of them since there was very low investment in their education as entrepreneurs, in their skills as entrepreneurs, in showing them the way and supporting in, in, in any kind of way to uh, make some significant step ahead. And, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, even starting a business is a huge success. Now, situation is kind of improved, but the things are also changing on a, on a global level. Here in, uh, in the region, especially in Serbia, you can get 150, 200,000 euros just for a good idea. And there are good programs supporting such initiatives. And hopefully some great businesses will come out. I'm, I said hopefully because it is very hard to track and it, it takes this little extra uh, step ahead to monitor and observe and you do the follow-up once you support some, some business and then be uh, on their side to help them grow. Otherwise, it will be a waste of money, anybody's money. Um, on the other hand side, uh, the situation in terms of uh, attracting, uh, attracting investment is also improving. Uh, we can see the growing number of VC funds coming to, to the region, investing. I, like, uh, I had a great pleasure that five of uh, high potential startups that we have just introduced to the program have uh, 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 access to finance through different VC funds uh, only in last month and a half. So the situation is kind of improving in that way. And there was all, there will always be this discussion whether there is a lot of money but not good ideas or there's a lot of good ideas but not enough uh, uh, funds for it, uh, to, to support it. I think the situation goes uh, in the way that the market is being developed. And uh, the, the market for sure is uh, uh, developing in a way that uh, it still needs some uh, strategic planning to be made. Otherwise, the existing resources will be uh, uh, exceeded in a very short period. Uh, we can see that only a couple of hundreds, and I'm very optimist when I say, that, I say those numbers, are uh, completing uh, uh, their graduate studies so they can, especially in the IT industry, while the demand for programmers is a couple of thousands on the annual level. Fortunately, when there is no uh, uh, government or no public uh, sector planning, fortunately, uh, uh, private sector jumps in and uh, and it, it, it uh, came with a uh, deployment of different uh, private uh, initiatives that uh, enabled uh, people to change their careers and, you know, in a, in a short period, uh, learn the basics for, uh, for uh, skills that will enable them to enter this uh, growing industry. So even when the, the programs that are being developed and it took years for them to be deployed for, uh, vocational education or, you know, for pre-qualification, there is a uh, market that will solve the things uh, in an in a easier and fast way. So uh, I could conclude now, maybe you can leave some uh, space for for the discussion, but uh, things are uh, moving uh, ahead, but the whole, um, the whole sector is moving ahead as well. Um, 
there is a lot of room to be uh, uh, for the uh, improvement of conditions that would uh, make younger uh, populations stay here or even bring them here back. But uh, either way, uh, if the collaboration on the regional level is not going to be uh, 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 enhanced, and if the communication is not going to be uh, easier, uh, then um, no no planning, no uh, strategy, no action plan would uh, would help. Uh, when you put us all together, the whole Western Balkans, we're still very small market, and uh, only by uh, you know uh, joining the forces, I think we'll be able to offer the better place for young people to stay here and uh, to to finance their careers, also for the businesses that will conquer the world from uh, from this region, but also the uh, global players that will come here and find a, a fertile soil for, for their investments. Thanks. Thank you very much from this point of view of another stakeholder, <laughs> which is very relevant. And um, I ask Teresa Albano, uh, to take the floor. So she's uh, um, actually connecting online. There we go. Okay, we can see you perfectly. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay, you have 15 minutes. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Teresa Vano, and I work as Economic Affairs Officer at the OSCE, the, uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe in Vienna, the Secretariat. Um, I wish to uh, thank the organizers and also the speakers who um, provided their insights uh, before me, because uh, I believe uh, what you have been uh, saying uh, complements uh, very much what we as an organization are doing in the field of uh, uh, innovation, digitalization, uh, um, brain drain and local development. So allow me to start uh, from uh, the mandate of the office in which I work, the Office of the Coordinator of Economic and Environmental Activities, because I believe that the first question uh, in this debate is, uh, where does security fit, uh, fit into the uh, overall discussion on uh, innovation in the Western Balkans? Uh, so first of all, allow me to remind uh, the comprehensive concept of security of the organization where um, economic and environmental topics uh, play a relevant uh, role. So uh, in uh, what we call the second dimension of the three pillars uh, that, com that form uh, the overall and comprehensive concept of security of the OSCE, the second pillar is what we call the trust building measure, the um, uh, course of action where we support uh, um, good economic governance and uh, um, good environmental governance. And both these issues, both these two aspects, uh, they factor into innovation um, and uh, the fight uh, against the brain drain. So we start from the mandate in 2018. Allow me just to briefly point uh, to this aspect because, because in 2018, during the um, Italian chairmanship of the OSE, two main uh, documents were adopted uh, by the OSE. I'm sure that you are aware that the OSE adopts uh, uh, its deliberation by consensus, which means that the 57 participating states, they all agree on the text that is adopted. While uh, these documents are not legally binding, they are um, the expression of the political willingness of 57 states, including the Western Balkans region, uh, and not only, well beyond. I'm sure that you are aware that the 57 participating states of the OEC, they span from Vladivostok to Vancouver, as we say in our internal jargon, including the whole of the European Union, Southeastern Europe, Eastern Europe, South Caucasus, Central Asia, the Russian Federation, Mongolia, and uh, Northern, uh, uh, Northern America, United States, and Canada. So 
in 2018, the human capital development in the digital era uh, ministerial council decision was adopted together with the declaration of digitalization as an enabling factor for good governance. Starting from this mandate in which the organization is encouraged to support participating states in the digital and green transition, supporting innovative business models that are in line with international labor standards and in which innovation should factor throughout reconciliation efforts and the economic security efforts wherever the organization works. So I'm sure that some of these terms resonate in the why the OSCE is engaged uh, in the Western Balkans. We look at innovation from a very specific um, point of view through the lenses of security, which is not the hard security of hard security organizations, but it's a more wide and comprehensive concept in which economic and environmental factors, as well as political factors, they all contribute towards an enabling environment where people feel welcome, comfortable, they can thrive through their studies and through their business models. So the project that we are implementing in the Western Balkans, which is called IDEAS, and it's funded also by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also by the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, is based on some questions that I would like to share with you, because these were some sort of existential questions for us to engage in this area. First, what kind of business model do we want to promote? Because COVID-19 has, has brought a number of lessons, okay? In, in 2018, when the project was developed, we still didn't know, but in a way that could be also considered as a sort of a, a long-term and uh, forward-looking uh, perspective, uh, these uh, two uh, declarations and, and uh, these two documents adopted by the OEC, they were insisting on digitalization as a model for, as an approach to increase resilience, economic resilience. And this is what COVID-19 in fact brought as a hard lesson to learn. Uh, digital economies are more resilient. But then also an additional question in what type of business model brings to, um, to the table. The OSC is a values-based organization, therefore we should carefully choose what kind of economic model we promote as an organization, because some business models, they structurally increase inequalities and socioeconomic disparities. So this is the reason why, with the IDEAS project, uh, we chose a very specific sector, which has not been mentioned by my pre predecessors, which is social economy. Social economy um, is, an is um, a business model that addresses social and environmental challenges through an entrepreneurial approach. And there is an whole new generation of digital and green innovators in the Western Balkans who are really willing to thrive and are willing and, and, are, and are in need uh, of further support in terms of regional ecosystem and in terms of local environments where they can find a fertile soil to first acquire the skills they need, but before this, to um, be exposed to a culture of entrepreneurship, which in my opinion is one contributing factor that um, also hampers uh, many um, young people to embrace uh, uh, careers that go towards innovation.
there is an, an actual need to foster an entrepreneurial culture in the region. And this is the reason why with this project, we target a very specific group of young people, aged 18, 25, people who are still at high school sometime, or they have not yet chosen their university career or are just in the middle of their, um, uh, of their university studies. So uh, the way we shaped this project uh, is the answer of all these questions uh, that I am putting on the table for a joint discussion. The final question is why? Why are we doing this as a security organization? Our intention is to foster reconciliation, reconciliation within the region, which is a precondition for all the action plans, all the um, regional agreements and uh, engagement of different stakeholders in order to allow the region to move forward. There are still standing tensions uh, and we want to address these tensions by investing on the spirit, the team spirit of young people, going beyond uh, possible language cultural divisions. We speak the language of innovation, which is the language of young people. So innovation for us is a means and an objective, but primarily is a means to achieve the objective of a more secure, uh, more cohesive region in which young people can find that their place through a business with a purpose. Uh, young people, particularly this generation, are looking for a purpose. They are not looking exclusively at the maximization of profit. And this is the reason why the social economy business model can offer an answer to their um, uh, to, to, to their drive towards a uh, um, more inclusive uh, region in which everyone can feel be part of the common good. So um, the, um, in, in doing this, we are going not only to foster upskilling of young people, not not only by providing additional digital upskilling, but particularly by discussing with young people alternative business models. We um, established a very good collaboration with Social Economy Europe, which is the biggest lobbying group in the European Union, gathering more than 2 million social entrepreneurs, uh, which um, contribute to a significant percentage of the EU GDP. And we do this also in order to expand the access to market for the young entrepreneurs, the young startups that we are going to facilitate. Um, we, we are going to support in uh, attracting, uh, attracting investment, attracting uh, credit for their ideas, which will be primarily selected according to, to their social and environmental purpose. The second, uh, uh, let's say, um, stream of activities will be to foster a regional network of young innovators. So we are going to provide a metaverse-like platform where young people can um, can access, they can share their ideas, they can uh, establish uh, um, connections uh, and uh, establish uh, collaborations. Uh, we got inspired by the makers movement. So uh, the idea is to replicate a sort of, of regional uh, um, network of young uh, social and digital innovators so that they can feel that they belong to a same group of like-minded young people. The final course of action, the final stream of activities relates to uh, policy-relevant dialogue. And uh, 
we also had a, an initial discussion with the Regional Cooperation Council um, to, because we are working uh, to draft uh, a green paper on social economy in the Western Balkans. Again, social economy, I would like to reiterate, is not uh, a business model of class B. On the contrary, I really believe it is the class A business model for the future, particularly in a world where there is an increase in uh, there are increasing challenges vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, energy, um, energy, the protection of the environment, uh, and uh, the identification of ways to um, make local, um, local environments more um, pleasant, uh, more uh, environmental uh, mindful, and uh, socially inclusive. All these aspects are those that can attract also, um, that can attract uh, the so-called uh, um, digital nomads uh, who are a category that local authorities in the Western Balkans are so much willing to attract. But uh, in towns and cities where um, people cannot breathe because of air pollution, uh, because uh, transport is uh, extremely, um, uh, it, it, it is not really functioning the way it should be, where waste management uh, is still posing excessive, uh, excessive challenges and where health services uh, do not allow, um, um, where are, are still lacking a number of, of, uh, of, of services, then uh, we need uh, social economy to factor in the service sector because the service sector is key towards an enabling environment to retain uh, young talents, to attract talents from abroad, to build inclusive and innovative societies and economies in the Western Balkans. So we work very much at regional level and a local level. So our main stakeholders are regional uh, institutions, particularly in this policy relevant dialogue and uh, local authorities. And this is the reason why we have established a dialogue with NALAS, which is the network of uh, association of local authorities in Southeastern Europe. So allow me to conclude <clears throat> by um, inviting uh, all uh, the stakeholders today and we um, in our kickoff meeting in February we enjoyed uh, the participation of the deputy secretary general of the regional cooperation council we also invited uh, EBRD the um, European investment bank uh, um, social economy Europe uh, and many other stakeholders including uh, innovative social entrepreneurs from the European Union to spark uh, ideas and to spark exchange of ideas with the new generation of innovators in the Western Balkans. I strongly believe that there is an immense potential in the region, exactly because there is something special about being from the Western Balkans. And this is this kind of uh, regional spirit is what we are trying to foster with this project, uh, working with the young people and for young people and investing in their capacity to, um, to uh, read the future and be present and work today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Theresa, and I think what you brought on the table is a very um, original and different uh, argument and uh, model that I think we we didn't discuss before. So um, I think, um, well, uh, I would like, of course, to jump into this uh, immediately, but maybe because Sinisha is then um, concluding his participation in the seminar Why we're gonna stay here until the end. Maybe I would take um, the opportunity to give him 
the the chance to react in case uh, to the things that um, we we just said and maybe to tell us what he thinks of this uh, model based on a sort of a, let's say generational identity of uh, start uppers or innovators uh, which uh, uh, let's say is not very optimistic if we then uh, um, spread it in the in, in a horizontal generational <laughs> vision because the economy is probably made up of the older generation <laughs> of entrepreneurs and business makers so this is might, might work in the future, but let's say in the present and in a sort of medium term perspective, probably we cannot adopt it <laughs> so easily. And it also brings in a new general perspective also to fundings, to collaborations and all this. So um, maybe Sinisha, if you want to either react to uh, what uh, Diane and Teresa uh, said, and then we bring all the issues at the very end uh, with all the other panelists. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, the great talks, both by Dan and Teresa. Uh, I believe that uh, the key to uh, development in our region uh, is regional cooperation. Uh, there simply isn't uh, a way around it. Uh, Dan mentioned a very important thing, uh, which is the size of, uh, of our market. We have 17, 18 people, 18 million people uh, max. And if you combine our GDPs uh, together on one pile, it boils down to two uh, metropolitan areas such as Istanbul and, I don't know, uh, Munich. So uh, we, we really need to uh, spearhead uh, regional cooperation. Uh, I believe that innovation and science are the key uh, kind of... Uh, front runners in this respect. Why? Uh, Teresa mentioned reconciliation. Uh, unfortunately, our region is still burdened very much uh, with uh, the legacies of the past. Uh, we have uh, ongoing political tensions. Uh, the old and pretty rigid uh, political structures uh, tend to be uh, in, in power uh, through directly or indirectly. And this has been ongoing uh, uh, process for the last three decades, really. Uh, to change things, we need, obviously, new people. Uh, we need people who understand where the globe is heading. Uh, and to, to get to this uh, point, we need to provide them environments in which they experiment uh, and fail safely, so to say. We still uh, are pretty much uh, dependent on on what our parents and what our education system taught us uh, about, uh, you know, having a safe uh, job for the rest of your career, uh, just sit in, in a public institution somewhere and uh, do uh, what you're told to do until you retire, and that's about it. This is changing. Uh, this is uh, a process, unfortunately. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, I believe one of the previous speakers mentioned Albania. Let me give you an illustration. Five or six years ago, in Albania, there was almost nothing when it comes to innovation. Pretty much nothing. There, there were no uh, infrastructures, no incubators, uh, no initiatives, apart from some sporadic ones that had no influence, really. But over the last uh, three to five years, uh, partly uh, thanks to some projects financed by the European Union uh, and some development agencies as well, uh, this has changed. This has dramatically changed. Now the Albanian ecosystem, startup and innovation ecosystem uh, is really catching up. Of course, it will take years until uh, it reaches some levels we've seen currently in the European Union. But the point is, uh, this can be done. We uh, as a region are renowned for being very creative, uh, uh, in, in particular when it comes to uh, creative problem solving. And this is one of our advantages. But uh, again, this, this cannot uh, function, this cannot grow in a vacuum. We need to provide a uh, playing field for uh, those young people. Uh, Teresa mentioned this Young Innovators Initiative. Uh, I think this would be great because uh, on various fronts, 
not only innovation, but if you get young people together, they actually get to meet each other. They they start learning that uh, they have similar challenges, similar dreams, similar ambitions, similar problems they face in their own environments. And they're not special in, in any way. And this uh, helps connecting people. This helps building friendships. In many cases, these rigid political structures, and I'm very open about it, uh, tend to uh, keep us isolated from each other for a very specific purpose. When people are isolated, they are easy to, man to manipulate with. And this is something that we as uh, people who uh, have this privilege of speaking to some audiences should be saying openly. This is not to criticize any uh, government, it's just the way it is uh, around here. And this is something that we've been seeing for, for decades. But if we want to move ahead, uh, we have to do, uh, we have to start from our own courtyard. We need to clean it first. And we have to understand that uh, it's, it's only up to us. It's only up to me to do, to develop my own potentials. Uh, you can't expect the European Union or the Italian gov government, the Italian embassy in Belgrade to do it for you. Uh, France can assist, which is great. EBRD can assist, that's great, RCC too. But at the end of the day, it's what we see in our mirror. It's us who have to do things to change uh, for, for our own benefits, but also for the benefit of, of, of our societies. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Sinisha. So if you agree, then we keep the general discussion at the end with everybody. So we switch to the other table of um, discussants and Teresa, and then you're gonna stay until the end. And uh, so we're gonna switch the, um, so please <laughs> take your seat. So I'm calling Kristina Jankovic from the, yeah, thanks a lot. From the Serbia Games Association, uh, Darko Subotin, vi Visual Effects Animation and Game Art Department from the Faculty of Dramatic Arts in Belgrade, and Biagio Carano. Oh, I'm going to do. <laughs> okay, you're going to help yourself. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> Biagio Carano, founder and director of Eastcom Consulting. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much again for you to be here. So um, we're very happy also to discuss of a, a sort of good practice, uh, as we call it, of this gaming uh, um, cluster. So we're going to ask Christina and then Dian to tell us a little bit more, and then we can conclude with Biagio. So please go ahead. Hi, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us in the first place. And uh, I was very pleased. Uh, when Francesco contacted us in the first place to uh, tell us about uh, this research because it really coincides with everything we are trying to do uh, as a cluster organization, I guess it's the closest term uh, we can use for us. Uh, so I'm Kristina Janković Ovočina, the executive manager of the Serbian Games Association. Our members are teams and companies and studios in Serbia making video games. Uh, we have been around for four and a half years, and when we started off, we had eight founding members, and now we have 130. Uh, I think it's a really huge, huge leap uh, in such a short amount of time. And there have been other developments, uh, I would say mostly in the past two years, really, really rapidly. Uh, and I think it's thanks to um, these three pillars that you also mentioned in your research that we maybe call a bit differently, but they are essentially the same thing. Uh, the first one is um, the support of the ecosystem uh, or the, the community is a term we prefer to use. Uh, the other thing is, of course, education. Um, Darko can tell us more about that. And the third one is uh, what we call a business uh, climate, uh, how easy it is uh, for new teams to uh, develop. And also what you mentioned recently really um, stuck with me, uh, not recently, but in previous presentations, um, 
that there is sometimes enough funding or business opportunities, but the teams are not investment ready. Uh, that was specifically the case in the gaming industry a couple of years back. But now it's really uh, a lot different, I'm happy to say. And hopefully today we can find some of the reasons for that um, improvement. Uh, and of course, if there are any questions or anything, I would be more than happy to, to answer. Darko, maybe you should take over. Hello, uh, thank you for uh, inviting uh, us. I'm really happy to be able to talk here today. Uh, I'm Darko Subotin. I am an assistant professor at the Faculty of Dramatic Arts and one of the founders of the new department for animation, uh, visual effects and game art at the Faculty of Dramatic Arts. So uh, I would like to first uh, tell something about uh, our uh, motivations for actually starting this new department as uh, Mina Cetinovic Pavkov, she's our uh, head of department. She couldn't be here today, unfortunately. But uh, so we worked at the Academy of Arts and uh, we had experience, you know, through the um, whole education system. And we kind of founded the whole curriculum and whole, whole program based on our own experience and what we thought was lacking in the whole uh, education system. So we actually got an opportunity to open this new department and kind of everything was in place. Uh, so one of the, one of the uh, bigger uh, changes we wanted to make was to include the industry in the formation of our curriculum. So that was, something that we uh, focused heavily and consulted with uh, companies. So we have actually uh, strategic uh, companies like Trilateral, which is now part of Epic Games, which are like the uh, creating cutting edge interactive technologies. And so uh, the industry was really involved in creating our curriculum and uh, supporting us. And we continue to actually try to uh, um, collaborate with the industry and to uh, incorporate them also into the teaching uh, on our program. So, for example, on the third year, uh, we actually uh, invite experts from the industry to share their knowledge with the students and also to show the students uh, around the companies and to connect them with the companies. Uh, one of the reasons we thought this was important is because the education system is generally very slow to change and uh, very traditional based, right? Especially in the arts department, uh, in the arts uh, educational system. So uh, we found out that uh, many uh, faculty members also don't really uh, keep up with the technologies. So uh, one of our key um, goals is also not just to educate students, but to educate our fellow professors, you know, so that they're not afraid of the new technology, uh, because uh, we are really a good synergy of art and technology, and technology plays a great part in our tools. And so uh, one of the... Uh, one of our other goals was to actually try to um, incorporate this uh, new way of making art and also to try to look ahead because especially in the audiovisual sector, uh, there is a really um, a big uh, merging of technologies in animation, visual effects, and game uh, game technologies, game art, right? So what we actually uh, try to do is to foresee this merger. This is like the, this is happening right now, but we are trying to uh, form our curriculum, form our program so that we are keeping up with the latest developments in these fields. Um, so what I would like to, maybe discuss is uh, the importance of SGA 
for our uh, because we feel like uh, we really need to be a part of this cluster and faculty of dramatic arts is a part of the super cluster of uh, the companies in Serbia and um, we believe that uh, this interaction is important because the education we we, we kind of saw a gap in the communication between the education and the industry and especially you know i can only talk about the artistic uh, side of the uh, educational system so but uh, in in this sector we we saw that there was this gap and we are trying to actually mitigate that on our end right um so yeah uh i don't know if there are any questions yeah. okay i'm jumping in and i'm spoiling you that <laughs> as far as i know darko in fact uh, is a practitioner from the industry then then stepped into the university yes. so this is the sort of fluidity and the necessity even from the academia to uh, take talents from the industry to become then teachers and then create new talents themselves again. So I think your personal history is also very interesting, but we stop here because uh, we make a sort of pause. So we have the presence and the honor to have here uh, the ambassador uh, Gori, who is here to um, welcome us and then uh, uh, greet us uh, for this meeting and uh, Minister Cascone also from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. So just to uh, give you a snapshot of this meeting, we are presenting here the results of a, a small research that the uh, CESPI and the OBCT undertook uh, uh, with the uh, fieldwork on case studies uh, bringing innovation and brain drain into the same sort of uh, um, concept how innovation could be a key factor to stop uh, or reduce brain drain and in fact here we have some protagonists uh, that can represent a good practice uh, in Serbia with the gaming cluster sector that really uh, showed us how to evolve innovation into a dynamic uh, and systemic uh, uh, way to address these uh, issues and also contribute to economic development. Uh, while in the Western Balkan um, scenario, let's say there are uh, large potentials that are not really exploited as other uh, presenters uh, helped us to understand. And there are different private and public initiatives that are addressing all these aspects in a way or another, uh, focusing on young talents, uh, startuppers, uh, if not uh, funding uh, mechanism uh, to address this. But what is lacking is a sort of um, general cooperation and collaborations among stakeholders uh, that they can all contribute to address these aspects because a good solution is only partial if it's not involving other important players. So uh, we are happy to have you here. Yes. Robert Dan, good morning. Uh, sorry to disrupt uh, a little bit the, the seminar, but um, yesterday and, and today uh, I'm here with um, Andrea Cascone and Carlo Romeo, two colleagues from uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Rome, and uh, they are here uh, for meetings with Serbian authorities in order to prepare a business forum uh, between Italy and Serbia. And uh, actually, I would uh, say a couple of words uh, uh, on innovation, starting from what we are doing, because uh, I uh, we read uh, with uh, great interest uh, the report, and let me also thank, uh, of course, uh, the Osservatorio Balcani, Caucaso, and Trans Europe, and CESPI for, for the, the job uh, they have done. And thank you, all of you, for, for being here and uh, for what you are doing. Now, very briefly, uh, of course, uh, uh, innovation, uh, brain drain is something uh, very important also for the bilateral relationship between Italy and Serbia. And, uh, what we can uh, reasonably uh, try to do uh, in this respect is also to try to develop also the economic relationship between the two countries 
and uh, uh, to try uh, somehow to uh, invest uh, uh, through our companies uh, here in uh, Serbia to invest in uh, young talents uh, and to invest also in a way to uh, have uh, the, the right people working in the right places uh, for the right objectives uh, here in, um, in Serbia. And actually, uh, my mission here and uh, the objective of Italy in Serbia is uh, precisely now uh, the objective to renew the economic relationship between Italy and Serbia and to have uh, an economic uh, a partnership uh, much more focused uh, on innovation, much more focused on the new sectors, uh, much more focused on the sectors where the technological component is more important. And the business forums, forum I was mentioning uh, would be a little bit uh, the flagship project that we have in mind uh, to give the sense that uh, we are moving to uh, a new direction. We are trying to uh, bring the economic relationship to a new level with a specific focus uh, on all the sectors that are very innovative from uh, green transition, energy diversification, digitalization, artificial intelligence, uh, agri-tech, all the sectors where we believe uh, Italy and Serbia can really uh, make the difference. Then, of course, uh, uh, with regard uh, to the brain drain and with regard uh, to all these uh, items, uh, uh, education is, uh, is key. Uh, we are investing also in, um, in this field uh, with our uh, educational system, in particular with the dual educational system here in Serbia. So there is a program with our companies, which is uh, quite uh, uh, important. And of course, uh, also in the relationship between our universities, uh, we have uh, many programs also uh, in the scientific field uh, to try to uh, train uh, and to work with uh, Serbian uh, students and with Serbian uh, scientists, but with the objective then to have them coming back to Serbia and to give their contribution here to their country. So let me thank you once again for what you did, for the discussion you're having, which is very important uh, for us and which is very important also for the way we are trying to imagine the relationship between Italy and Serbia in the coming months and years. Thank you very much. I invite Mr. Andrea Cascone, head of the UT on uh, Adriatic and the Balkans. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. Um, really, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning, I am very happy to actually uh, participate to an event that uh, somehow uh, ends a project that was financed by my unit, by uh, our uh, ministry. Um, we, and I'm very grateful to Chespi and Osservatorio for the efforts they put in, uh, in this project. Uh, when uh, we discussed, I mean, with them, this idea was really to uh, let's look at where is the potential for youth in the region. Uh, the brain drain is a clear challenge to this region, not just Serbia, but the wider region. It's, it's, and it's just a challenge also for, uh, I would say for many countries, including in Italy. Now, in the case of Western Balkans, it's a structural challenge because these countries are still in a process of uh, transition in uh, open market, transition towards democracy. So uh, we see there a clear, um, hurdle to be cleared in order to avoid that these countries, I mean, loses the most precious resources they can count on for advancing in these uh, processes. That's So the idea was, let's see where we can invest in order to keep the youth in the region, to help them contributing to their uh, economies, have been contributing to their democracies. And this project is just part of a larger uh, strategy. Uh, I see Teresa Albano connected uh, with us. I mean, OSCE is also a beneficiary of uh, Italian contribution for uh, youth entrepreneurship project. But I'd like also to recall our uh, um, project with EBRD uh, for youth in business. We have also contributed to the Regional Youth Cooperation Council 
for integrating student associations from the Western Balkans and the European Union. And together with Chespian Observatorio and uh, Regional Cooperation Council, we organized uh, last year in Rome a forum between youth from the EU, uh, European Union and Western Balkans to have uh, youth from this region, together with the peers from the European Union, discussing about the future of Europe. So this uh, uh, this is uh, the strategy that really looks at the youth dimension, the youth agenda as one of the pillars we want to uh, invest. And uh, I really look forward to reading the uh, final report of this uh, project, because I believe this is always very useful for governments to get fresh ideas, to get food for thoughts in how they want to uh, shape their policies, their cooperation activities in the region. This is the kind of uh, help that we usually find very uh, useful for our action. So I really encourage you to uh, build up on the uh, discussions, on the findings you have found on this uh, on this report, and you can count on uh, our, uh, our support on in Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs support. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I think we go back to our discussion now. So um, after the um, Serbian Gaming Association and cluster <laughs> or community, uh, <laughs> so using different words and then it's well, same but different. Also, community is nicer, <laughs> probably. Um, so we give the floor to uh, Biagio Carrano uh, to help us also have an overview from his observatory. Yes, thanks a lot, everyone. I mean, we, we will start, I mean, try to understand, I mean, if the rhetoric of the Serbian government, uh, the Serbian government has put in the last years about innovation, ICT, uh, also digitalization as a way for good governance as a, let's say, a real basis, for example. And I would like also to say that to promote innovation is also important to have an innovative view about the subject of our uh, uh, interest. So let's see, I mean, what are the changes, I mean, in these countries we have seen in the last years, for example. Let's start with the data about the export uh, in uh, ICT. Uh, this is an important data because uh, three years ago, the government of Serbia has launched the 4S strategy, is a smart specialization Serbia strategy. And this is a very important because uh, the Serbian government has defined four areas of interest, I mean, to promote innovation in the country and also to stop a brain drain. The first is, uh, I mean, uh, food of future, a way, I mean, to produce, to distribute, and also to, uh, to manage the agriculture. The second is uh, ICT, of course, and we will uh, talk about this, uh, I mean, more in more details after. And then there is a future machines. It's a, a new way to reorganize, rethink manufacturing. This means also connected with the industry 4.0 concept and the last one are creative industries you well known for example uh, uh serbia stvara platform this means serbia creates that is one of the main uh platform promoted uh, and uh, publicized by the government for example so but let's see what is going on about the export because at the end we need some data to see if something is changing in the economic structure of this of the country and we can see that in four years we have seen uh, the export in ICT reaching 440 million uh, euros and uh, dollars exactly. So this means almost uh, doubling the data of four years ago. And this is absolutely a good result, but we have still to say that Serbia is still behind uh, Croatia for what is, I mean, ICT export, as well as also Bulgaria and Romania. Bulgaria is uh, uh, at more than $1 billion of exports and uh, uh, Romania, it's 2.3 billion, by the way. You know, by the way, you know very well, since it's your sector, that Romania is also very strong in the creative industries, audiovisuals, and so on. Since uh, a multinational like French Ubisoft starts opening, I mean, uh, maybe 30 years ago, the first, I mean, headquarters in, uh, in uh, Romania. Uh, so this is something positive. And another data about the brain drain is to be considered is that between 2016 and uh, the 1st of January 2023, it means tomorrow, the basic, the minimal salary has been doubled. So from 21,000 to 40,000 dinners. 
So this is really a, an important growth. And this is also a challenge because this means that the company is willing to invest here. They have to rethink the business model. I mean, cheap labor cost is not the same like not 20 years ago, like five years ago. We are speaking about, I mean, this minimum salary is starting from six, just six years old, from 121 dinners per hour to now, I mean, 230. This means that also industrial, this means it's a, a strong push to have uh, more investments, I mean, in innovation also for uh, uh, production processes. It's not only in general innovation, not only as a technology digitalization, but also in the fields of any kind of manufacturing. And the third data that I would like also to point out is that if we compare the data between 10 years ago, eight years ago, and today, the unemployment rate has fallen by, I mean, from 23% to 9%. Now the unemployment is, well, uh, is uh, substantially a problem of the countryside. We can see that in Belgrade, I mean, the, there are a, a, a strong inflection, and this means that at the end there is a, a low rate of unemployment. So there is a strong polarization, and this is also a social challenge. There is a strong polarization, stronger and stronger every year between the capital and the countryside. All the talents, I mean, there is not only a national brain drain, it's important to point out this, there is also a brain drain from a, a marginal countryside to the capital. Biagio, is 9% for youth unemployment or like uh, general unemployment? It's general. Data. General, okay. It's general data. It's the latest data from World Bank. Uh, and this is another problem because it's hard to think a new model to develop agriculture when you have the countryside strongly depopulated by this kind of brain drain. So it's a multifactorial. I mean, it's a, there are many sides of uh, uh, the relationship between innovation and the brain drain, also inside the country, of course. And when you have economic growth, especially concentrated in, in Belgrade and Novi Sad, like we have seen in the last year, you have this concentration of talents, let's say, in the capital, and this depopulation, and uh, of course, this uh, empowerment of uh, smaller cities. I'm not speaking countryside, also smaller cities. An opportunity from one side and the others. Another point is important. To, yes, we are now at around the latest data says that in ICT digital sector, we are now involved in, there is an involvement of around 50,000 people. That's it's very good. Consider that this environment has been also uh, dramatically changed, and the, we will see this uh, change, especially in last in next years, from the arrival of around ten thousand ICT professionals from Russia. And these are the data. The the, the, the figures we have it's around five thousand people, any kind of specialization, from uh, junior WordPress, let's say, to database database management. I mean blockchains and so on. It's, uh, it's around 5,000 new professionals living in Belgrade, 5,000 living everywhere in the rest of the country. And for sure, there will be space for some kind of cross-fertilization between, even if, even if these Russian professionals has brought with them their, uh, their value chains, especially working for German companies, for example, in some fields like banking and automotive. We, we know, for example, Luxoft, of course, the arrival of Luxoft here, but there are many other, I mean, companies well organized. I'm not speaking about freelancers. So this means that next year, we will see for sure a big increase, a, a big increase of ICT exports from Serbia because all these professionals have, have established it from March until uh, now around 2,000 new companies by oh, Serbian law, so under Serbian law. This means that this uh, will affect the export, the statistics, and we will see a big, a big boost in this data. And probably we will see uh, some kind of competition between uh, Serbian ICT companies and Russian ICT companies also to find, but also an occasion uh, to find the new talents, but also to engage new talents, but also an occasion to uh, 
to cross fertilize, I mean, and to create a new way to cooperate together. So it means if we see this kind of uh, uh, data that everything is going well, uh, it's not like that. It's not like that because uh, I would say that uh, uh, all people involved in ICT, in ICT companies, many of them, are also living in a work environment uh, very democratic, open, I mean, to dialogue, open to democratize the innovation, uh, open to, I mean, promote, I mean, new ideas and uh, real involvement in, uh, in, the, in the company and the uh, empowerment, not only female empowerment, but just empowerment of, of the youngest one. It's uh, exactly what many times the same professionals don't see when they go out of these ICT companies in real society. And this is really a one point to point out. So there is some kind of education to open dialogue inside ICT companies, innovative companies. There is a, a promotion of uh, be vocative about also limits of some uh, protocols, for example, because it's part of Scrum and the Agile methodologies to check and to have a, a clear dialogue, I mean, on what is not going on to, to have a better release. But on the other side, there, is a, there are emerging needs. Emerging needs from people that have a, absolutely on a salary in average, three times bigger than average in Serbia. These are the official data. We know that uh, thanks also on formal payments, the, the standards, the living standards of uh, programmers, the ICT people is uh, higher than the statistics. But on the other side, we have emerging needs. Uh, there is an emerging needs for uh, environmental protection, the quality of life, I mean, the quality of environment. There is a strong request to have a better uh, public education, since at the end, the companies need to invest on this. There is also a necessity, I mean, to have, a, if we want to use this formula, a better, a more effective, a more uh, balanced uh, rural love. Rural love because there is uh, many risks of abuse of power in many institutions, by many institutions or other subjects and players. And so we see that there are these uh, kind of emerging needs and they're also about identity traditions. And so what we want to say that uh, one of the main point to promote innovation is also to promote uh, uh, from uh, uh, in a grassroots way, but also from uh, uh, thanks to external actors, the social capital. Social capital is a fundamental driver of innovation, any kind of innovation. And social capital doesn't mean, I mean, familiar links, bondages. We, we know very well. You know that uh, if we, we want to bring our Italian experience, in 1993, Robert Putnam, one of the most famous sociologists, I mean, published, uh, I mean, uh, Making Democracy Work. It's a study about the effectiveness of Italian institutions, particularly the regions. And so the big question was, why in Lombardy, I mean, why in uh, Emilia-Romagna and in Tuscany, I mean, the regions work so well, so the communist party say, because we are very good in administration. Robert Putnam discovered that Lombardy was working well and also Emilia Romagna, while Southern Italy was working. I mean, the effectiveness of these institutions was weaker. Why? Because there is a study, there was a problem about, let's say, the presence and the strength of a social capital. In Northern Italy, in Central Italy, there is a tradition of clubs civic association, it's what uh, Robert Putnam calls uh, civicness. And civicness is not that people are good or bad, are more used to be involved in the destiny of a community. In any case, they are more involved in doing charities and not in doing charity, but in doing any, any kind of no profit activities to give to be relevant and to to have an impact on social communities and this is also something it's a sensitivity growing among ict community correct me if i'm wrong in serbia
to be relevant, not only as uh, techies, let's say, but also as uh, citizens. And so I would say that innovation, of course, the focus of this research is about tech and digitization. But I will say that uh, there is a lack and necessity to bring in this country all the tools to promote social innovation. And social innovations means to be resilient, to be cooperative, to create tools to engage people and to recognize the importance of, this, of the single individuals in, the, in any kind of change, not to wait, like also they, Antonich has said, to wait the state of local uh, municipality to fix a problem, but to promote grassroots time in initiatives to fix the problem from, uh, uh, from scratch. And this is absolutely, I think, a, a growing need coming from this country that from one side has reached uh, some results, good results in ICT digitalization uh, and uh, promoting also a, a kind of uh, uh, ICT digital culture. But on the other side, uh, exactly the same people that are benefiting these uh, improvements in material conditions are searching for, uh, to, to fulfill new needs in terms of quality of uh, environmental uh, the environment, quality of their citizenship, quality of their ability as individuals to make an impact in the social environment and to be innovative, not only inside their companies, but to be innovative in the society they live in. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Biagio, for this, uh, um, uh, let's say, not strictly economic contribution and point of view. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Andrea and the Buster, um, to uh, the the potential of innovation also with the social impact, uh, like diffuse social impact. So um, I'm going to open the the floor to uh, general questions, and um, I ask Dejan Tonic if you want to join us uh, here. Uh, probably, no, there's a chair up there, exactly. So. Any question then can uh, can be put to the discussions on the stage, and there is also Teresa uh, there. So questions can can be from the, the audience to the speakers, but also uh, the, among speakers and discussants. So you can put questions, and probably I'm I'm starting with the first one uh, to Dayan. Uh, that you were mentioning that one of the problem is in fact the lack of collaborations in the initiatives that you probably were also witnessing <laughs> the the success or the the limited success so um can you can you be a little bit also specific on what could be done to pro promote or increase like partial collaborations with some starting with some key players and among them and the whole stakeholder group there are uh, local administrations central governments uh, um, like the gamers uh, uh, like uh, um, um, yeah, exactly. Other uh, lobbying associations or entrepreneurs or others because if you never start from a certain point I mean and I think we could see also like with the um, with the project uh, on, uh, um, it's called Ideas, uh, Young Developers, like uh, it's a very nice project. So uh, so how could this be done concretely? And also probably I would ask you, what do you think of the model that Teresa was promoting? Because um, if you focus on a sector or the conditions on, on the environment, you don't focus on the business model. So for you, it shouldn't matter what is the business model. And on the other side, we, we think uh, this business model should have certain threats. So um, please. Uh, thank you very much for this question. It's uh, definitely not uh, easy for me to, uh, to answer to uh, either of uh, of those two, two questions. I'll, I'll start with the first one. Um, uh, what what uh, could be a, a uh, magic spell or, or a magic combination for keeping us all together on the same path and how to enhance this collaboration in the region? Uh, I, I guess we should all start from 
uh, uh, looking out from the perspective of the daily work that we are uh, doing and uh, uh, trying to learn more about the other initiatives. I'm present in this uh, uh, sector of international development for let's well, say 15 years and the same issues that were uh, uh, kind of the uh, noted in the in the uh, in Serbia and, and in the region that, that there is a lack of collaboration between uh, different uh, uh, donor initiatives, different international uh, organizations, different uh, international, international key players that are trying to uh, uh, enhance the uh, uh, conditions in the market society and the, the political atmosphere. Uh, the same situation is still ongoing. So um, I, I guess it takes uh, some extra efforts to uh, look around and, uh, and uh, uh, note what are the activities that other players other stakeholders are doing at the moment. Also be proactive in, uh, and again, even if it's not your scope of business, trying to be proactive and match uh, uh, people that could collaborate or, or that could benefit from collaboration. For instance, if I know some program that could be a good of, uh, 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 that could be of interest of some of the companies that I, I cannot support, I can play a role of a civil servant and say, well, I can't support you, but, and that would be the end of the communication. But uh, on the other hand side, I can say, well, there are other programs that you can benefit from. And if I see that also is an interest for uh, for my business, for the program that I'm leading, the Star Venture, uh, I think the, that kind of attitude could be applied to different initiatives. So uh, again, there's a lot of, know-how being brought from uh, more developed markets here in the last 20, 30 years. There's a lot of, also a lot of good um, examples that, that can be uh, exposed and the spotlight of the, um, uh, for future investment and future entrepreneurs and future uh, stakeholders who would like to deal with the matter could be definitely, you know, put to a higher uh, level so uh, there's a lot of things that are uh, that were done in a good day before there's a lot of money being thrown uh, on like while we are talking and that's uh, that's uh, uh, that's for sure but on the other hand side uh, there are good initiatives there are good examples of businesses being done and started here from the region and at least we can collaborate on exposing these good ideas and make them serve as an example. Um, maybe from the public in the room, there are, can you come up here so people online can see you? Yes. And if you also want to introduce yourself. Yes, sure. Come here, come here so okay. they can <laughs> start it. Okay, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm Mari Maria Maric, and I'm working as a consultant in Eastcom Consulting. And I would uh, I would just take a quick look on the research that you did because I've been also doing uh, similar research on the similar topic. I would say in 2018, uh, when I was a student at the Faculty of Political Sciences, it was done by NGO Libek, but it was regarding only Serbia. So my question is. Um, Considering the data, especially Human Capital Index, which was published by World Bank, Serbia's Human Capital Index is, let's say, above the average, is 0 0.76, and Croatia's is, for example, 0 0.72, and Slovenia's 0 0.79, while uh, on the other hand, we have Bosnia and Herzegovina and Montenegro and Albania with 0 0.62, uh, sorry, and Kosovo 0 0.52. 56. So my question is, um, what was your, let's say, starting hypothesis when you were grouping the country uh, which on which you will conduct the survey? And were you afraid of maybe some misinterpretations, let's say, of the results uh, regarding the context, contextual background in the first place? Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe if there are other questions, we can take some. Uh, 
Yes, yeah, sure, but you have to come here anyway. <laughs> Very much. Uh, yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> yeah, first, first, I wanted to make a very short questions for discussions. Uh, the first one for Christina. Uh, the gaming uh, sector was particularly interesting for us, uh, not only for what it represents, but what it could represent as a model also for other sectors of the economy. I don't know if you have the opportunity to talk with other economic actors uh, here in Serbia, and uh, if you see uh, similar developments in other sectors, innovative sectors, and what's your opinion if your organization and the gaming sector could really provide some, uh, as I say, positive uh, examples or practices you know, to be transferred also to, to other sectors. Uh, and to Darko, we spoke a lot about young, skilled, high, highly skilled uh, people, but in a very theoric, theory, theoric way, you're working with them so I wanted to ask you if you could make some sort of short portrait of the people that we were speaking about. You started, I know that you started working uh, this year with people who want to enter uh, the this particular sector. So can you just give some insight about who they are? Because we are just speaking about in very theoretical uh, terms and not in, in the, you know, just wanted to give a face to these people. Uh, yeah, the, these are my two questions. Uh, I don't know if I have also to answer to, to, but maybe, yeah. I mean, uh, honestly, we didn't have, uh, I would say, um, a particularly uh, clear uh, picture when we started the, the the research. So we wanted to uh, focus as much as possible on clusters, existing ones. Then we found out that it is not that easy to find them in uh you know realities like for example Kosovo and Albania uh from this point of view as maybe this is connected also to my question to to Christina uh we what we found is that there is something especially in uh, more advanced uh, countries uh Serbia is one of them and that uh, these uh experiences can really provide some kind of you know uh, window towards the future. So we didn't start with a very very how to say clear set of uh, expectations towards what we were going to find. And again, as we explained the, uh, at the beginning, uh, this was not a purely economic kind of research. We are, we are not uh, economists. We wanted to have a feedback on uh, self uh, self perception of innovative actors in the region. So we really wanted to understand how they see the situation and the perspectives and problems, challenges, and you know potential. So that was the starting point uh, of our research. Thank you. Uh, do we have something to add about the research team? The first question? No, no. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Francesco, for the question. Uh, questions actually. So uh, to start with the first one, um, we are of course in contact with other um, ICT and other um, adjacent, let's say, areas and um, actors and stakeholders. And I would say recently there has been a lot of movements and improvements uh, in uh, blockchain, medtech, and agrotech. I believe these are the three um, segments uh, where they are. They are um, conceptualizing similar associations to ours, uh, and we are actually uh, openly sharing our experience and all the things we have done uh, for the gaming ecosystem so they can use the same uh, in theirs. And these are actually one of the four, uh, including gaming, one of the four um, sectors with uh, most, um, I would say, the, the most promising uh, future if, if everything is done correctly. Uh, so from our personal experience, uh, what might be some advice for uh, other stakeholders that are trying to uh, improve their ecosystems? Uh, the first thing we realized we need to do as an association is research. Uh, mm -hmm. Without data and measurements mm -hmm. and like hard data and specific um, reliable answers, uh, you cannot negotiate with uh, the government, with stakeholders from outside of your country, uh, with academia and everyone else. Uh, so we um, made a very detailed questionnaire that we sent even in the first year uh, of when Yesgia was formed, a uh, very detailed questionnaire that we sent to all of our uh, members and all the companies and teams and studios we knew uh, that were operating in Serbia. 
Uh, we do this annual research every year, and the result of the questionnaire is our annual gaming industry report. Uh, you can find it on our website, sga.rs. Uh, so far, we have published three of these reports, um, and they, I, they, are, they are, I would say, uh, the most uh, consulted and the most reliable um, mm -hmm. source of uh, up-to-date information about the ecosystem. Uh, so not just that um, it measures the current state, it also measures the growth mm -hmm. and the rate of growth uh, of the ecosystem. So year after year, we can see uh, improvements in the number of games published, uh, the number of people employed in the industry, uh, the number of women employed in the industry. We are actually in the uh, we are the top one country in Europe when it comes to women employed in the gaming industry. It's uh, thirty percent. Uh, the median in the world is, I would say, around sixteen, and in some countries, it's even lower than that. Uh, so we're very proud of that, but there's still a lot of work to be done there. Uh, we are also measuring. Um, where the the workforce is coming from, from which universities. Uh, we are tracking the progress of um, formal and informal programs that offer education uh, concerning gaming. Uh, so really a lot of um, data that is interesting mm -hmm. for all different types of stakeholders. The media, of course, uh, they always ask about the revenue, <laughs> which, is, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, which is also growing uh, year after year. So my number one advice for anyone wanting to improve uh, any ecosystem mm -hmm. or a part of an ecosystem is uh, measuring uh, and getting hard data. <laughs> and of course, making sure that uh, you cover as much ground as possible. Uh, so your data mm -hmm. is um, as reliable uh, as it can be. Uh, another thing that is crucial and that we don't actually have, um, mm -hmm. and we see it in other uh, European countries and in the gaming industry, <laughs> are gaming-specific funds. So there are funding oh. here, as we mentioned, uh, more and more in Serbia, but they, they are not for gaming specifically. And I think this uh, is particularly damaging to younger teams uh, mm -hmm. that are so sort of... Um, uh, reluctant to apply to funds that are not specifically for gaming or medtech or agrotech or whatever. So we have these like all around funds that cover everything from innovations in uh, mm -hmm. agric agriculture to innovations in gaming. Uh, and, you know, of course, the amount of um, uh, red tape and, uh, uh, and paperwork <laughs> that you need to do is also dissuading teams to apply. Mm -hmm. So if they have uh, funds that are specific for what they are trying to achieve, it's a lot more encouraging, I would say, for them. Um, and I'm sorry, the ambassador is not here anymore, <laughs> uh, but Italy actually um, started a gaming fund a couple of years ago. Uh, and also France, Germany, they have um, they increase funds uh, in these grants uh, year after year. And we can see that uh, the number of games published before uh, these funds yeah. uh, and grants were introduced uh, skyrocketed in the year, even mm -hmm. in the first year after the funds were introduced. Uh, so to sum up, uh, basically, uh, research and uh, funding mm -hmm. that are, let's say, friendly, uh, mm -hmm. ecosystem friendly. Um, and of course, not to mention uh, everything else we, we're doing in terms of uh, connecting the community, educational programs, mm -hmm. and other initiatives. Uh, you can uh, get informed about all of that on our website sga.rs again mm -hmm. and that's the last advertisement <laughs> i'm gonna <laughs> say for the Serbian games association uh but i'm guessing darko can also um, answer the next questions and maybe mm -hmm. uh, expand on what i've said if you have anything thank you uh so i will first answer the question regarding our students because i'm very happy you asked we love talking about our students uh so uh our students uh, mostly are actually from other uh, universities and uh, so we have uh, 14 students that are uh, at our department and uh, what I can say about them is that uh, they are really um, energized. <laughs> they like to participate in uh, extracurricular activities and they are really active during our uh, classes. So uh, what I think is actually happening there is because um, during our initial interviews, when we were accepting students, uh, one of the uh, comments was that uh, some students actually didn't feel challenged enough at their 
previous schools. And so I think what we brought to the table regarding the students and what motivates them is the up-to-date knowledge that we give them uh, and also uh, the freshness mm -hmm. <laughs> of, of our department. And uh, also we are motivated to actually try to uh, um, improve and uh, make the classes as interesting as possible. And also our curriculum is uh, not so much theory based as mm -hmm. uh, practical based. So uh, I think that uh, really uh, motivates them to learn and to try new things. And we try to motivate them to do mm -hmm. those things and to collaborate. And so, for example, one fun uh, uh, story is we had um, uh, at, we were at Gamescom uh, as uh, exposing. Uh, uh, yeah, we had a boot at Gamescom, mm -hmm. and the students were uh, really active, and they actually made like these props from video games <laughs> that they could wear, and so. Uh, it was their own initiative, so we didn't force them to do it. So yeah, I, well, all I can say is we are very uh, happy uh, to to have such a first generation, and we hope that uh, the next generations result will also follow in their in their footsteps. <clears throat> uh, regarding the, uh, I think I just wanted to add uh, regarding these funds. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that the European Union also has uh, game specific funds. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so just wanted to add mm -hmm. to your. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Teresa, do you want to? I, I see uh, yeah. your hand. Yeah. On Thank the you. Just. Uh, it's it's from one side uh, uh, an observation and on the other side it's a question for the game sector because we are also applying gamification approaches in our project uh, not to develop new games but to develop apps that could apply gamification in order to map skills identify level shortages and facilitate the mapping, the matching of label skill uh, demand and supply. It's an extremely innovative, innovative app, which was incubated in Italy, in Bologna, by, by the way, by a migrant. He is both US and Swiss citizen uh, of African background. He is Italian by chance, I would say. But uh, I was bringing this extremely innovative startup, which is disrupting uh, actually the matching of uh, 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 supply and demand uh, of labor in, uh, in Italy uh, with the big investments also from the private sector. So they apply a gamification approach for people to learn. And I wonder if in your school, you are also applying gamification, not only to develop new games, but also as an educational uh, uh, approach can, that can be apply, applied to any sector. So uh, actually, yeah. So um, we are still at the beginning. So we didn't have a, how should I say, enough uh, time and opportunity to do that for everything. But uh, for example, on one of my classes, I actually created a video game that teaches them how to <laughs> use a software for creating video games, you know? So, so yeah, uh, gamification and some kind of, you know, uh, bringing in those technologies into actually the, the teaching process is something that we have worked on and we will work on uh, in the future. <laughs> Uh, and maybe I would add uh, from the side of the industry, uh, actually not many of our members and gaming companies and teams are um, investing enough research into gamification. Uh, I think there's a huge opportunity and like a market gap uh, for, for projects like this. Uh, and maybe gamification is more suited to uh, primary and middle schools and high schools uh, than actually like universities and businesses. Uh, so that's also something to think about.
you would be surprised how you can apply gamification for adult learning. I believe that if I show you the app, you will be really appalled. The microphone works. Um, it's my turn to conclude. We are already at one o'clock, so I'll be very short because we've heard a lot of extremely interesting things. So Doberdan, um, and thank you all for uh, coming here and contributing to this um, discussion. I am Luisa Chiodi, I'm the director of Observatorio Balcani Caucaso Trans Europa, and I'm really honored to have listened to all your uh, speeches and um, my task is extremely difficult now because uh, um, I don't want to repeat what has already been done. I just want to return to a couple of things that I've heard, but it will be impossible for me to quote you all um, because of the quality of your speeches. And uh, let's say, uh, I return to the origin of uh, this project by saying that we uh, wanted um, initially to start um, uh, reflecting on the Western Balkans uh, under a, a different light, uh, for once not under political crisis and uh, uh, problems of, of the region, or even only about important things such as the past and the, the elaboration of the past, but also looking at the future. Um, also because we think of uh, the importance for our public, which uh, to start with is an Italian public, to have a new updated understanding of, of Western Balkans, um, to speak about uh, the Western Balkans in its complexity that includes uh, um, this uh, uh, extraordinary development, let's say, um, and the gaming industry is, is one of them, which I think attracted also the attention of our readers. Um, a few days ago, um, yeah, during a, a lecture in, in Padova, a student from, in this case, was Croatia, was not even technically uh, uh, Western Balkans any longer, um, uh, told me uh, his own explanation about why youth uh, uh, emigrate um, uh, from the region, because also Croatia, as much as Italy, by the way, but also Croatia has uh, this problem of um, uh, migration. And his answer is that uh, elites are enmeshed in, in the past uh, on old issues while uh, they manipulate the past for political reasons, while new generation need, need to look at the future, need to have a vision of the future. Um, so this topic of uh, looking at ourselves and having an image and an idea of uh, the Western Balkans also for political development um, uh, and economic development looking at the future. We, we heard about today about engagement uh, uh, also by um, the um, uh, hosting country is government in terms of strategies strategies for uh, um, uh, ITs uh, as, as, as definitely um, an important uh, sign of this uh, future approach. But at the same time, we know that um, the Balkans have um, still have a big problem of a political climate uh, related to constant uh, repeated emergencies. Um, and um, this uh, creates disappointment among uh, young generations and this is probably one of the main core reasons for uh, immigration, this distrust about um, uh, the possibility of a future, basically. Um, so uh, security that Teresa Almano referred to is definitely an, a fundamental issue, I mean, uh, uh, which uh, uh, this security includes uh, a vision of, of the future. But we know, I mean, uh, uh, some of these um, uh, emergencies that we went through uh, from the pandemic to the war in Ukraine, we've heard today, although catastrophic for, for those involved, uh, uh, create also opportunities. Um, we've heard uh, from Carano, for instance, the importance of this new community of IT that is uh, related to um, uh, migration from Russia. Um, so the, the idea to explore new firms for us has been extremely interesting and, and challenging. And we think it is a question of new narratives in a way Way of but of image that we want to give to, of the region, but also of, of self understanding, um, self understanding that include. Um, uh, uh, if we, you want uh, Italy in the game, because Italy has a, um, a vision of uh, uh, itself as part of this macroeconomic region, macroeconomic, I mean, user it is called, your, um, uh, now I've, um, this macro, macro regional strategy that includes uh, political, economic, and social visions of how we feel part of the same space. 
political space. Um, here, we need to understand uh, um, uh, the importance of um, perspective also in terms of uh, quality of life at home, which is part of this issue. And I uh, really thanks Karano for recalling the importance of these emerging needs. We've seen social movements uh, even in this country all focusing specifically on um, issues such as environment, uh, quality of environment, but also um, what is very important, I think, uh, the stress that uh, you gave on uh, the topic of how the tech community uh, can be um, a forerunner in bringing up um, these new needs and importance of facing them in terms of uh, uh, creating civicness, community, social capital, responding to, to this, um, th these needs. Um, of course, the indicators re related to uh, research and, uh, and innovation um, in terms uh, are generally lower than other um, uh, space uh, countries or European countries, not necessarily Italy. Uh, Italy is also lagging behind um, uh, with differences and at regional level, but still um, we are not a forerunner in terms of investment uh, in um, research and innovation. But what we also know, and I think we've heard uh, as well, is how much uh, uh, money are not, is not enough. Um, uh, so it's not an indicator per se. And we know from many other fields how much uh, the issue uh, is not only also in terms of a, um, creating an ecosystem, but also in following uh, the development. Because uh, things, um, in a way, are always easy to define in terms of strategies. It's much more difficult. They're con concrete development in the field so um as as within uh, the economic um within firms everybody knows a, a very important role is the one that follows the process also we should have more attention to uh, processes in real life in their concrete development um uh, uh, indeed, uh, the, you've uh, all recalled the importance of uh, the regional level because uh, those are small markets, those are small countries. Um, they are also, um, uh, um, you know, this vision of uh, of a region that needs to to recreate itself uh, um, uh, is certainly an important one, even when we look at innovation. So it is definitely um, an input that I think it is important to uh, take from from what you've stressed. Um, again, uh, definitely the importance of the educational system um, is uh, and, and the difficulties of the educational system to update. We again share a lot of the experiences at home uh, that you described um, because public administration is slow to, to change and uh, public ad um, education is part of this uh, difficult. Um, so the examples you've given us, I think is also inspiring for, for our own experiences um and and indeed uh, all the generations uh, i should be included in in gaming as much as in overcoming their fears of this um tra transformation which are positive in many sense but also scary um because they fa go fast too fast for all of us uh, and even young become old very quickly and uh, um find out how uh, you know keeping up with transformation is extremely stressful so um i don't want to keep you uh, longer um, I really want to stress that um, um, this for us was a tiny little uh, uh, experiment uh, to exit what we normally do in our uh, following political and social transformation in the region and we were extremely interested uh, in listening to uh, the protagonist views um, and having you here debating with us and hopefully this is just the beginning of um, a new uh, uh, interest and, and uh, network that we create by staying together today. Thank you. Eh, finito. Bravo, bravo. Bravo, bravo.